Hello. Uh, so hey guys, hope this the, the audio is back to normal now. Uh, is it fine? Or is it bad? Is it a little echoey? I think it's a little bit static. I can turn it down. All right. So uh, you can hear me, right? All good. You've all all, all set in. So we'll go live with the session right now. If your friends are joining us in, please intimate them that they can come and join in anytime they want. Uh, just finish the registrations outside, and they can come inside. So welcome to the second edition of React Chennai. I am your host this time. My name is Nitin Rambo Kamleshake. So uh, I will be with you guys today. Knowingly or unknowingly, you're stuck with me for the entire day as your host. So uh, I guess you're gonna have to get used to that. So which language is more comfortable for all? English, Tamil? The more interactive you guys are, the more fun this is gonna be. Uh, this is a very chill office, guys. It's a chill office. So, English or Tamil? Come on, let me hear you guys. Tamil. Tanglish. Okay. So, how many, show of hands, how many of you guys understand Tamil? How many of you guys are, uh, understand Tamil? Okay, that's nice. How many of you don't understand Tamil? So, oh, we do have people who don't. So, that means I'll, I'll stick with English. English is fine for everyone. Anyone who, who's not good or fast with English, you can reach out to me. I can help you to understand all the content that, uh, that's being said today. So, don't worry about that. So I'm Kamlesh, I'll be your host for the day. And before we go further, I just want to take a minute or two or two minutes to uh, talk to you about Talentship or what we are about. So rather than me just telling you what it is, uh, do you have any idea what Talentship is about? I believe we have some mic people, people in mics. Uh, if you want to use a mic, you can just speak through the mic. Uh, anyone, any idea what Talentship is, uh, what we do? Anyone? I mean, just give it a shot. If you do give it a shot, you get a goodie. No? Cool? All right. So, talent ship. So, like our name says, we're more like a shipping company. We build software for ships and we do ship building. That, that's what we usually do. That's about that, that's That's all I want to talk about. So, thank you, guys. I was just joking. I mean, we're not a ship building company. I mean, obviously. Uh, why, why, why is everyone so stuck today? I mean, no one's chill. I mean, I could see a little bit, a little bit of laughter coming here and there. We're also glued into the mindset. So before we go further, before I tell about what talentship is, I just want to tell you this is a more of a chill event. We all are technical professionals. Some of us are young. Some of us, are, some of us don't even have experience at all. So don't feel alienated. Be free. Be friendly. You can network with anyone who's here. You can talk to anybody. You can reach out to anybody. The more free you are, the more interactive you are the more interactive and beneficial this session is going to be for you. Because we have three amazing host uh, speakers for the day who are going to be taking this amazing uh, couple of sessions that they're going to have forward. So be more interactive. So do I have a yes? You'll be more interactive or no, you're not going to be more interactive. Yes? No? Maybe? Yes? College is very best. All right. So yes. Cool. So we at Talentship build, uh, help businesses build high performance uh, tech teams. So we specialize in AI, big data, uh, cloud, and 24-7 DevOps, and much more. So we have we've been able to do this for 50 plus projects. And we started off with a very small team in 2022. And we have a head growth of about 150, and we're going onwards to 200 by building uh, high performance business teams for uh, businesses. So you can learn more about us at uh, talentship.io, or you can reach out to the HR desk up front. And that's a very small gist I want to give about our company. And before I go forward with this, you're here for something called Chennai React. So the best people to explain why this initiative was taken in the first place and what we aim to do with this is going to be told by the brains of this segment. That is going to be Surya and uh, Nikhil. Uh, I'll hand it over to you guys to talk about uh, the Chennai React initiative and uh, why you initiated this uh, particular segment. Over to you guys. Thank you, Nitin. Thought you were fine. So thank you, Nitin. So, so why we started uh, this reaction? Uh, we don't have a vibrant community in Chennai. It's been for a very long time. I would see maybe in days of Microsoft uh, uh, context, like uh, regular events, but like no other one, no other people like connecting uh, regular events, just like uh, React Bangalore or React Nexus or like React India. So we wanted to take this as an opportunity where like there is no react uh, community group actively uh, in Chennai. We want to capitalize that and we wanted to um, grow the community. 
So that's the reason uh, we started. Uh, maybe we, uh, myself and uh, Nitin, Nikhil met like a year ago in uh, React Nexus. That's when it started. And we thought of uh, like creating a small community and like uh, see where it goes. But uh, the day one, probably like, uh, it took us almost uh, six months to evolve and then finally uh, create this group. And finally, uh, the first meetup was like massive hit, I would say. Uh, similar crowd we had, and uh, the second meetup, um, may not like uh, overall the repeating audience who came for the first meetup. Yeah, thanks for coming again. Uh, so we are like growing uh, uh, like anything. That's one thing like I already know. Uh, so we'll continue uh, doing this kind of meetup uh, in regular days. Probably we need your uh, support and. Uh, also, do follow us in uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Insta, uh, that uh, pass to do more such kind of events in future. Uh, maybe I'll hand it to Nikhil. He will say something. So, hi, guys. Uh, so, as uh, uh, Surya mentioned, we started Chennai React uh, uh, because we don't have a very good React community here in Chennai. So we used to have a lot of meetups happening in Bangalore, uh, Mumbai, and other places. So we don't have any concrete uh, meetups so in Chennai. So we started this, and uh, this is our second meetup. Uh, we had one in February that was a great event. So we're planning more such events in the coming months. So do support us by following uh, the QR code. So here we have all the links to all the social medias and also Discord channel. So please follow there. And yeah, so this uh, meetup is special. So we are collaborating with React India. So React India is a, a big conference uh, that's happening every year in Goa. So that's one of the flagship conference uh, around the world. Uh, so they have uh, their conference this year on October. So you can scan here and then uh, register for the event. Uh, so this will be a couple of days event where you can, where all the you know speakers, React speakers from all around the world, they will come here and then uh, you know, share their experience. So please take a look at this. And we also have a special giveaway uh, for one in-person in ticket for React India. So all you need to do is tweet about uh, this meetup happening here, take some pictures, tweet some, some whatever you have, you experienced here, tweet about it and tag uh, Chennai React and uh, React India. These are the handles. You can see the handles here. So tweet about them and also, uh, you know, uh, retweet and share basically follow us in all the social medias and we will select a random lucky winner maybe tomorrow or day after and then uh, we'll we'll announce it in twitter and linkedin uh, about the winners so yeah that's uh, for the giveaway and yeah it's gonna be a lucky draw you can uh, see the winners in the next day or day after and we started this uh, discord channel this is a very brand new so you can scan and join here uh, basically, it's 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 like an open channel where you can share your doubts, you know, uh, ask questions. People will be happy to help with all your questions, and there will also be job openings there. Uh, people will you know post jobs, and you can also reach out if you have any opportunities or if you want, if you are looking for any job, all those stuff. And yeah, and a lot more stuff are planning here. So do uh, join us on Discord as well. And yeah, as mentioned, uh, follow us on all the social medias and, you know, and get uh, notified about the coming events. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I'll hand over to Nathan. Oh, thanks, Nikhil. Thanks, Surya, for giving us that heads up. Uh, so I hope you, do you have any questions about uh, the giveaway or questions about uh, any of the uh, things that Nicola or Surya were saying. Any show of hands? Any questions about the giveaway, how the lucky draw is going to happen? Any questions? No? Yes? It's, it's cost like 18k. It's, it's happening in uh, Goa. It's like going to be two days in person event. So, who are uh, retweets or like create a new tweet? With uh, Chennai React and React India attack, they will be uh, we'll pick up one uh, person. It's going to be a lucky draw. Don't miss that opportunity. Okay. Go up for the another chance. All right. So 
the initiative uh, is what I want to talk about before I hand this over to our first uh, speaker. So at Talentship, we've started this new initiative called Talentship Community Events, where we're empowering a lot of communities to come connect with us so that we can help them to organize their own community forums in Chennai. So a lot of you guys here are not just React fans. Some of you guys here are uh, AWS uh, individuals who love AWS, Azure, and you may want to make that own micro community. You, know? you always have that knack. I have like 50 friends. I have 20 friends who sit on Discord and we talk about uh, something happening in my favorite software. We are here to make that dream happen in reality. So what we do, we help you guys organize micro events like this anywhere across our entire, uh, anywhere across our facilities here in Chennai and Bangalore. So if you are a member of such community or you want to organize these kind of micro communities, I'm Kamlesh, I will be here uh, in the lobby area. You can come meet me, have a small talk with me. We'll see how we can help you guys out and organize your community events here at Talentship so that you can make your community dreams, your micro community dreams into something like a macro dream, all right? So hand it over to the brilliant first speaker we have, uh, Arun Kumar, he's a very humble guy. He doesn't want to uh, tell much about him, but honestly, this guy has a lot of knowledge that uh, his age is more like my experience, but technically his age isn't my age, it's still the same, but he's actually more, uh, I mean like he's more brilliant in that stuff. So I'm going to give it to you, my guy. So you're going to take it forward. So I'm going to leave you in the hands of Arun. So Arun, over to you. Uh, before that, do you have any questions that you want to ask me? No questions? Cool. No, no, much no, Okay. Uh, I spoke it's audible, right? Uh, is it audible? Okay. So, uh, as, I, as, as he said, I don't want to give a big intro about me. Let's get into the blog. So, let my let me start the presentation. Uh, presentation. So, hope uh, you all know that uh, we are going to see about augmented reality, right? So, does anybody have an idea about augmented reality? So as you said, it's a real world class which I'm going to try. So today uh, we are here as a React community, right? So uh, things uh, in React Native are happening. So first let me get started with React Native because it's a part of React, right? So hope uh, anyone from React Native, anyone, any developers from React Native? That's great. So I didn't much expect this guy, so okay. Thanks for joining. So in React Native, right? Uh, I think last, uh, this week, right, they have released 0 0.04. Hope uh, everybody uh, aware of it, or if not, let us get to know it. So 0.74 is the latest version of uh, React Native, so which comes under part of React 18 only, still it to come. So uh, I think something happening big in React, I hope everybody knows that we are waiting for a big release where hooks and all, everything is updated. I'm waiting eagerly for that. So similarly with React Native, uh, we have a new architecture, which is around for four to uh, like uh, two to three years, like past four to five releases are happening. So uh, here uh, I want to focus on the augmented reality, how we can integrate the uh, augmented reality to the uh, React Native, with the React Native. So as you know, React Native is a hybrid platform. We can go with uh, both Android and iOS. That's the advantage of React Native, right? So, uh, the latest release, right, which is uh, very, very interesting. They have made Yarn as a, Yarn 3 as a uh, fully fledged one instead of NPI. So that's very interesting for me. So, uh, so let's, uh, looking forward to integrate with Yarn. So basically, maximum people will be using NPM as 
sort of uh, react native and react also but in react native they made yarn so i hope that will be the same case for react i am guessing it so but let's see what is happening so i think you know so uh, this is how it looks how much the reality as i said real plus real, uh, real world plus virtual world so you can see a virtual object there a um, small smiley bubble right so today i'm going to cover only the basic four topics so one will be what is augmented reality and to know augmented reality so we have some concept basic concept that needs to be covered so that's what i'm going to focus on and video video on other thing is pure react so viro react is a uh, open uh, library which help us to integrate augmented reality with react native so and we will get to know what is uh, how to integrate react and what are the things are there so so as you all know i all said already said uh, real plus which was not right so can someone give me give me some real time examples any of you okay pokemon go yeah snapchat talking about other things any uh, which is really useful for people in uh, day to day life which helps people in day to day life okay uh, amazon flipkart as the uh, ar there where we can check furnitures and other stuff right so i don't know whether you guys i hope you have heard of ikea ikea the whole speakers furniture right they are the first persons to develop air using air they developed like it's like 2018 itself they developed with augmented reality 18 or 19 itself they developed their own application with air uh, of course with native development like using android and other so uh, they are the first come software that uh, brings to the day to day life of customers so if you are going to for, for purchase a furniture then that means uh, you can just Uh, don't have to check scale and then and you need to check whether it can fit in our uh, room or whether it's possible to uh, align with the texture of your wall so you can customize everything uh, with the application itself so so as i said these are the uh, examples so and uh, you see you can the middle you can see the furniture how the furniture uh, application works so just a basic static examples so there are the types of air also here i have given you the types of air so two types of air basically we will uh, differentiate one will be the mark, marker based and another will be markerless air so first let's focus on marker marker based air right so marker based air is like something so the third object uh, as you see uh, third image is the marker based air so where you have a pre defined uh, image or uh, any uh, pattern that is used to do we give only the uh, prescribed uh, 3d object or a image that whatever the user wants so it is a fixed one so it will be uh, uploaded uh, and the only the image that brings you right which will be pre defined one so we can't customize it once we pre defined it it will be there for the particular image or uh, points so uh, another one is markless uh, based layer so markless based layer is uh, it will it can be there anywhere so for example i will tell you one thing is one example is geo geo based location uh, so geo uh, location based air is one of the markerless based location and another thing is uh, superimposition based air so for example uh, consider a situation uh, where uh, you are driving a bike right so while driving a bike your your bike was uh, turned off somewhat the, somewhere the issue is there so you don't know because uh, consider me i am it guy so i don't know much about mechanical so uh, i'm not comfortable with that also so uh, i don't know what to do next so where we have a ar with the help of ar we can just scan the uh, whole uh, bike or a car or a particular engine for where its uh, issue is happening so it can uh, give you some idea about uh, what is happening so what needs to be done so you can if you want you can have further instruction where it can show you what needs to be done in the uh, real world how to connect both things are also so what needs to be mis- dismantled and where you have to focus on so all the things can be uh, used with markerless air so uh, another thing is uh, uh, markerless air as a, uh, now it's available uh, in adobe air so using adobe air we can uh, create a geolocation based air 
so for example uh, if uh, now it's not completely in india but it's happening in paris or uh, all the other cities abroad cities right so let's take a one um, major example as paris eiffel tower right so eiffel tower has um, you know lot of uh, uh, people it's uh, uh, basically lovers will be there so apart from that uh, people will usually visit paris because uh, it's peaceful and everything it's a unique eiffel tower right so uh, when you use geolocation based ai you pick some object around or uh, surrounding eiffel tower right so whoever can whoever comes and scans the particular image from a google map they can able to see the uh, whatever ai whoever uh, imports that ai in a particular application so now the google is developing that uh, let's not focus on i'm just giving one example of this right so so this will be the two types of ai and the examples of ai right so the i said that fundamental concept so why fundamental concept of ar is needed so here uh, ar is a new platform right ar is may, may, most of you may not be aware of ar what what uh, it does exactly while you are coding so this will help you while you are coding the understanding the uh, bureau sdk so this uh, six concept sound concepts are mainly used in the uh, terms of uh, coding also so these are the uh, most sound to eight concepts so so motion tracking what we'll see motion tracking the motion tracking is simply right so for example consider this object right so this object water bottle i'm placing here so i'm taking my phone and i'm uh, trying to scan so like i'm trying to track the object right that it is there so if i if my camera is not moved or tracked the particular object whether it is moving or stable so uh if motion tracking is not there then it will not be please feasible to i or it will not be impossible to the user also right so that's why the motion tracking is mainly so motion tracking mainly in front of camera so other sensors also is there so uh, motion tracking is included other things like planes also detection of planes uh, vertical planes horizontal planes everything is present in the uh, motion tracking yeah. so this is that identification of object where the particular object is there based on your movement the camera movement or uh, device movement So next we will get the environment understanding. So as I said, right? So environment is very very important. So we are interacting with the real world, the real world. So if there is a wall, we sh- the phone should identify there is a plane, sir. We should not go. We cannot go beyond that. So that the object should not go beyond that also. So the environment understanding is very very important in the case of uh, air. So depth. Another thing is depth, right? So so consider uh, I am placing this object here. i am trying to play this object here i can't go uh, go beyond this particular uh, object right the bottle so while scanning right so your mobile will be there so this object is uh, static and uh, you are trying to play as another 3d object so consider this as a 3d object in your brain okay so this is a real world object so this is a uh, real object so this is a virtual object so you are trying to uh, Get it behind this prop, behind this button. So that means what should happen is, uh, it's the camera or the system must know this is a 3D object. It has some depth, right? So it should not go beyond this, or it should not pass into this. It like have to go beyond this and around around it, it has to go. So that's how uh, it is. See, okay. see, they are trying to place a virtual 3D cat where they are trying to uh, place the cat behind the uh, sofa, right? So. the particular object should go behind the object it should not uh, make the ca- cat looks the first image is without depth second is with depth so which is more pleasing so as you see the first image is not pleasing to the eye it's not very interactive to the user as we uh, connect with the real world so light estimation so simple uh, so see here you have a light estimation so just consider me as a real world object right so if i'm standing here my focus on the light will not be much for you right so if i come under the light then uh, you will have a clear idea about what my face looks like right? so that's really needed in the real, real uh, virtual world also so that's why you are seeing the shadows and everything will give a 
pleasing to the eye and it will give more experience it's not like it will give it will make a 3d object as 3d object so it will not look like a 2d object so that's very very important light test situation even while while we are trying to develop a reactive design so there is a component called light test situation as well because without light the uh, object may not be uh, uh, clearly identified or it may not it may not be uh, feasible to the eyes also so occlusion so occlusion is one thing is based on this only so similarly same concept with depth so here uh, uh, occlusion is if you see the chair i'm trying to place it beyond the uh, table so table is there i'm trying to uh, beyond the table but uh, without depth or uh, without this occlusion effect so uh, it is not there with occlusion and depth uh, the uh, chair is placed behind and you know that okay the chair is behind the table so this are the uh, major fundamental uh, another one is anchoring so anchoring is like so uh, that's what i said so i am placing this object here for a instance if i come back again the object should be the, at the same place we should not move somewhere else right we should be at the point where i place it so that's what real world works that's the same thing uh, with the virtual world we are calling we are handling with anchors so anchor will help you to determine where you uh, left the object So uh, before going to video, right? Uh, does anyone have any questions in AR? Like AR fundamental concepts, or do you have any questions? So uh, depth is something like for identification. Occlusion is a effect, right? So with depth only we can achieve occlusion. So depth is like something like uh, the functionality for camera, right? Functionality of camera to identify the depth, right? Okay. So we have lidar scanner also in iPad. we can go beyond this in mobile instead of ipad if you go there is a uh, ipad has a lidar scanner where uh, it uh, gives you much more understanding of it basically it's uh, um, the function is the depth one and the operation is the implementation yes operation will be the uh, effect on the implementation of how you interact so does anyone have anything so i know it's little boring because it's a basic concept so that you guys get into it uh clearly while coding right so uh this is the video react so shall i move forward so the, i hope everything is clear with you guys right so uh video react so as i said these are library uh, for uh, enhance in the augmented reality so why video you could ask me right why video there there are n lots of sdk right why video so uh has anyone heard of hero before no right, right. okay so this is the main concept uh, for video so we uh, we have uh, two different uh, 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 platforms right one is ios one is android it supports uh, we can't push android into ios or ios into android right? that's the basic concept of here so we have two different uh, ar sdk for two, uh, two different modules actually for ios we have different for android we have different sdk so this viro right viro uh, react right what does it do is they do a native coding and brings us into a react so uh, this uh, video right it's using a uh, bridging concept of bringing the uh, ar core sdk for android and ar kit sdk for ios and bringing to a uh, single code base so where you can react with uh, only react native so only uh, with using react native we can interact with uh, both sdks for ios and android single single code base so as i said why you right it's very easy to learn it's very very simple uh, in terms of that so we have other sdks also right we have other sdks like uh, react native screens ar screens or anything is there but uh, especially i choose viro is another thing is it's a open source and community it has a largest community when compared to other sdks it has like a, a discord community where you can uh, have people around and you can uh, clarify your doubts if you stuck somewhere you can go and approach people there so it's a, that's the main reason i chose viro for augmented reality is they have a open source com open source as well as the community sir so one advantage of another advantage of viro is right they are compatible with vr as well as ar so both uh, ar and vr is uh, present in the viro so if you want to go with vr also it can support so we are like sdk like uh, daydream and uh, corbot sdk is uh, is allowed is Uh, supporting that 
so we can also use VR, uh, VR in terms of uh, you think if you want to go with VR, you can also do. So as I said, right, two major SDK. So these are the two major SDK we have to uh, focus on for Android and Android. So basically, this brings the both two SDK into a single platform. So uh, while before developing, right, uh, one disclaimer is it does not support simulator. Even if you have iOS, it does not support simulator. Uh, because you are dealing with camera. So camera cannot, the simulator cannot provide the camera, right? So it cannot support simulators, even Android emulator and iOS simulator. So this will be the prayer request. And uh, for Android users, right, I think most probably India will have a lot of Android users. There is a some specific uh, limited devices only uh, supported for AR. You can check in a uh, website. If you just uh, Google it, AR core uh, supported device. So it will show you some list of device. So there is limited amount of uh, device. So before trying to develop something, please check these papers and you have a device with you. Otherwise, you can't enjoy the process. It will be very painful. So even if you develop fully, you can't able to see the output. So, so this is a basic installation. And uh, one uh, disadvantage is they do not provide auto linking. So as you guys know, uh, in React Native, we, uh, there is a concept of auto linking. So we need to give uh, the other Android and the iOS platform that I am using this one and using this one. Uh, in a particular uh, files, we have built out there and uh, we have pause file also. We need to specify that. And uh, this doesn't do it. We have to do it manually. I'm skipping, I'm skipping the process. So uh, here comes our uh, major concepts of uh, uh, what, how we are going to interact, how, which components uh, we are going to use in uh, React Native for AI. So first concept uh, will be the uh, uh, scene, right? So in, in generally, if you go to 3D or any uh, type of uh, UI web, right? That they will call it a scene. Okay. So scene is a basic uh, functionality for a particular uh, base base for the augmented reality or any development in AR or VR. Okay. So the scene is mainly uh, used here. So we have two types of scenes. One you can see is zero AR scene. So which is a uh, one tag, and another one is zero scene. So zero scene is basically uh, mostly we can use for both 3D and 2Ds and everything. So that's a basic uh, base for uh, all the stuff. So uh, without uh, the scene, we can't proceed further. So the main component and the first uh, element should be the AR scene. So, for example, you can have uh, for a for a particular application, it may have uh, different types of scenes, right? So, one thing can be uh, uh, like uh, as they said, filter. One thing can be a different filter. So, what if we have multiple scenes? How we can navigate to multiple scenes? For example, um, uh, just consider uh, you have a you are seeing a three D object of a car, and that you want to change the colors, right? In this case, the scene may be changed. So for that, we have navigator. So that is for uh, scene navigator. We have zero AR scene navigator. This is only tags. Just as you do in React, right? Just a simple tag. I'll show you the code. Uh, so uh, apart from this, right? Uh, as I said, we need to detect the plane. For example, if we are going with furniture, the furniture should be placed in the ground. It should not be in the lying in the air or it should not be sticking to the wall. So whatever, uh, they have some, uh, so for example, TV is fixed in the wall, it should be fixed in the wall. It should be fixed in the vertical plane, right? So this is the horizontal plane. So where we will be placing all the furniture here. So for that, we'll be using planes. So uh, we can also have a plane selector. So if you want to specify something, so this, uh, for example, you want, your application is only focused on furniture. That means you don't have uh, any other uh, option. We need to go only for horizontal. So you don't have any other uh, options to go with vertical. So that's not needed, right? Let's not uh, go uh, beyond that. So let's fix the uh, plane to the horizontal. So that's why we are using uh, uh, zero AR selector, plane selector for fixing the uh, header for horizontal or vertical. So two things are there, only supports Android. One is horizontal upward and horizontal downward. That's only supporting Android. So we have to be specific in terms of going with uh, two both things. If you're going for iOS, it cannot support. Uh, 
so navigate when it comes to navigation right so as i said uh, we need to navigate to the further three to four screens or something like that so we have all the options here push pop and jump and replace so this is the basic operation as you guys know so i think push pop and replace you might have heard i am i'm not sure you have heard about jump so jump is, jump is something uh, new here so what jump does is uh, it does uh, remove this tag so for example if you have some scene in the lower lower order it will remove from the lower and it push to the top if there is no scene is there then it will act as a pop uh, push sorry it will act as a push so uh, this are the basic uh, navigation so uh, we'll come to the scene now so while you are developing the scene right you, you are using a scene so we need some background right it cannot be empty so for example um, if you are focusing on some uh, closed object so some closed environment so that means we need to have some background for example so for that we will be going with two of three or uh, two objects that we have uh, two tags like zero 360 image and uh, below sky dogs so 360 image is like a uh, 360 object uh, we have a image object so where it supports uh, for uh, below 360 and apart from it uh, skybox skybox is a closed environment so this can uh, be created like uh, for a uh, like portal or something so i'll show you guys what is it so uh, like a closed surface it will be like surrounded with four walls only four walls like a box big box uh, it's it's a, a basic one that gives you this experience of a sky also in the top it will be like a sky also so right so we are dealing with the three objects right so we only have access x and y in 2d and computer also right we have only x and y so where comes the z so z part right so bureau has a, uh, one more advantage here it allows for six degree of freedom so uh, you may have three degree of freedom access xyz but what is six degree of freedom in mobile right uh, we have a six degree of freedom which suppose based on gyroscope so gyroscope is functionality is to give us the access of Six degree of freedom. So you have you no know, forward, backward, right? So apart from that, there is three degree axis, like uh, three other axis, like pitch, yaw, roll. So this is the three other axis that uh, that can be achieved with gyroscope. So this SDK also uses accelerometer gyroscope, and it has a uh, latest and uh, high performing rendering capacity. So because we are dealing with 3D, you need to uh, if even uh, some of the apps you can see if you can see in the a uh, couple of months back instagram is down for a particular whole e being evening right it's like we are dealing only with images and uh, videos we are not even dealing with reels but it the whole app is set down so what we are going to one more round we are going to deal with 3d objects so 3d objects is something like it's more rendering so more graphics is needed so for that they are providing higher rendering access also they are have bureau as a high rendering access So this was the uh, simple object you can play with. So uh, for example, you are creating a AR, right? So you just need to place a scene first. So that will be the hierarchy. For a single scene I'm saying, you have to place a scene first. After that, you can use any one of these objects, either uh, image or a 3D object or a text or a small box or a, a marker-based AR. So marker-based AR basically functions like I have this, right? I have a uh, tenor react off page, right? So, marker base is something like it will recognize this particular uh, image, right? The Im image marker, right? It will uh, image, uh, it will recognize only this image and it will show you a predefined image, whatever the developer is given. So, if you, if you, if you make this image as a marker and you place, if uh, you place it like, if this is found, this is found and analyzed, then you are, you are going to place a 3D object. Or any any type of object you can say. So, for example, I'm saying a box, small box is that means. So, uh, only the only the small box appears only when this is recognized. This particular image is recognized. So that is what Vero uh, AR Image Maker. So, with using that concept, you can just upload an image. That will be a target image. We'll say a target image there. So, once you given as a props to this Vero uh, AR Image Maker. You need to pass that image as a, a prop 
and you need to uh, 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 apart from that you need to give a object 3d object or any object you can give so it will recognize only when the particular image is target image is found it will only show the particular object whatever you have placed so this will come under marker based layer so uh, as i said right 3d object so uh, we you may you may create a three object using blender or maya or autocad anything right you can create your own three object so what if we need to uh, provide that three d object into our application so for that we will be using uh, below three d object so as i said this is a basic 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 first level of uh, uh, rendering a scene so this thing identifies uh a text so when you take a camera uh, uh the text will appear as a hello world i have given the question as x y z so i have given as x as 0 y as minus 1 and z as minus 1 so you can change accordingly so it will appear however you want but i i showed you right before so bar your camera stand so uh, your camera you will start in a position 0 0 minus 1 only you are when you are developing right you should uh, keep it in mind that you will, when you are developing the camera will start from 0 0 minus 1 so according from according to that you need to give a position for your uh, development so uh, this is will be the uh, as i said this is a basic thing. so instead of your text you can have a uh, a uh, bureau 3d object i'll show you one sample code i have done I hope the code is visible, right? So this is a basic thing uh, which is available in uh, Vero SDK itself. If you go to Vero React community, you can find this basic. So I just made simple uh, tricks only there. So uh, basically, we are using a basic via Vero ARC. Uh, based on that, I am using a Vero text. We have a lot of other components. uh like light scape simulation also is there as the i gave you the model concept right all those concepts as a particular uh, uh tag also for light estimation we have light estimation tag we have a anchor we have a anchoring tag we have zero anchor tag we have so there are uh, so even for plane detection i said we are having air plane selector and plane detection right so uh this is a simple code so here uh, if i enable this right this what this only gives the text whatever text we are going to give so here right if you see i made a change with the airplane so i'm detecting it the airplane is horizontal i have given the alignment as horizontal so and apart from that i'm just giving a small box small white box the scale is 0.0.0.1 only so it's very it will very very small but it will be visible to naked eye when you scan this image right So apart from this, how we have if we have a multiple scene, what we need to do? So I showed you for a single scene. What if we have a multiple scene? So this is a basic uh, example for multiple uh, scene navigation. So first, uh, the screen uh, navigator will be the navigation component. So um, in React Native, we have a navigation component. So similar to that, it will work for AR. So this is specially for the uh, scene navigation only. So uh, based on this. so we will initialize a first screen so i given uh, here as the first screen right so i'll show you the what is the first screen 
So passing is I'm showing a sample scene, and in the sample scene, I'm just pasting an image. So simple image. So I'm just giving my uh, image uh, like uh, image source as a like uh, request HTML. So you can pass an image there. But uh, for sample, I have given the image. So when we click the particular image, right? In the scene, when you click the particular, it will navigate to another scene. For example, for example, uh, if you see a poster, uh, just imagine. I know, I know, we are not seeing much of a movie poster nowadays, right? There is a there is there will be in the olden days there will be a lot of movie posters will be there. So just imagine that you take your camera, you go to the poster, and that poster when you uh, see in your screen, that mobile screen, it gives you the trailer. So when you give a uh, click right the particular trailer, it will start playing right. So for that simple uh, example, we can take this one. So you, uh, that is marker based. So here like this, similar when you touch, it gives you some interaction right. Similarly, when you give touch. We can move move to the next screen. So uh, second screen will be the next screen where you have a different action set. Right? So uh, as I told you, what what if you have a three D object that you need to place? So for that, this is sample one. So uh, first source will be the dot obj. So as you all know, three D object will be like dot uh, dot obj. So uh, we need to. Uh, provide uh, in the simple way. Uh, it may vary for your different uh, creation of OBJ. So OBJ may be different. So you may have in a big scale, you may have in a small scale when you create a OBJ. So uh, with this, we can uh, replace this. I think it's done. I think. So if you have any further doubts or any clarification, any queries, yeah, please. One by one. Can someone give mic? Like uh, you said, it's a cross-platform package, right? Uh, how performant is like compared to like uh, native code? Yeah, we can't compare to native code. Yes, they are using the native SDK. Yes, they are writing in a native. Uh, that's what I said. When starting session, like bridging, they are using a bridging concept. This yeah. code you can see it will be in the native code, and okay. they are taking that native code into React. Okay, so. Obviously, they're using, yeah. they're using native codes only. Okay. So obviously, there's be a latency between communicating between native codes and. No, um, that's what the advantage of. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, see now, uh, you you may say there will be latency, but the latest architecture now we have right in React Native mm -hmm. that uh, breaks all the latency. Right? That mm -hmm. gives lot of that breaks lot of bottlenecks okay. that are there. As you said, latency there are lot of things. They are trying to promote it to new architecture. So I'll say something about new architecture. New architecture also uses the same uh, uh, the same native code in Kotlin or Java. They would return the job uh, for Android. In iOS, they will return object code. No, but what advantage of new architecture is the difference between the uh, old and new is the old uh, new architecture take turbo module. The turbo module is a C plus plus compiler. Mm -hmm. So when you write some code in C plus plus, you know how efficient it is when compared to other code in a Java, right? It takes some bit of memory. It has each memory, also. but C, C plus C doesn't have. So they are they. If you use that, then it will be very easy. Okay. And also, like you mentioned about the OBJ files, object files. Yes. I mean, you will be giving embedding it with the application, or else you can pull it from the network or uh, something like that. Sorry, I couldn't hear. Like, uh, will you be embedding the OBJ file within the application itself, or you can pull it from the internet or something? Yeah, you can. So if you if you if you given the source right, you, okay. you can you can have it in your source file. Or apart from the source, you can take it from the cloud also, right? Okay. You can just, in terms of you give a HTML or uh, like any URL, you can, even you can use this S3 packet or blob storage for Azure, you can also use that. But only thing is, it will take some load on it. OBJ okay. file, you know, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of bigger. Yes. Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? Hello. Uh, what was the HTML resources that was loaded? Sorry? Uh, in the previous slide. That resources require HTML, that HTML yeah. texture. The, so uh, while creating the object file, right, we have some uh, textures, meshes, right? We have some mesh. So for example, you consider this particular, it has some mesh. It, uh, so if we create a plane object, it first 
uh, I'll say this texture star, right? The ones we have the like S shaped bends or that, right? Those are textures, and we'll say like uh, the ones we give are really heavy. First, initially, the object file will be look like only the shape. So it will be plain shape. If you want to make it transparent, you have to add some textures, add some uh, shadows, lightning for OBJ file itself. In order to fit shines in a better way, if the light shines, right? What should happen? Where, where should it shine? So we can add all those textures. So just a simple example that uh, it's not in the format, uh, HTML format. It will be like uh, uh, some uh, textures dot, uh, some shadow files will be there. So I, okay. I'm not exactly sure of dot what extension it is, but okay, okay. we have textures and uh, meshes of that. Okay, I just got confused that since it is yeah. HTML, I got confused with, with So the... even in the first, uh, we previous said I would have taken the HTML image. Um, can we place objects in the app? Because all yeah. the examples... Yeah, is... yeah, that's what marker list is. So I'll show you one. This right, this will be in the air only. This will be in the air only. Okay, it will be an air. Yeah, it will be not in the ground because okay. I did not give any claim, right? I'm not giving any claim. This, this, I said, right, the camera will be in the Z00 minus one, right? It will be in that axis, it will be focusing. So, until unless you specifically give it this horizontal, this vertical, it will be. In there. Oh, so, we can, uh, you know, direct any object and then based on the object, we calculate the those positions and we place the object. But if we if we don't do the direction, it will be on the app. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I have not covered entirely because you know this is sim uh, simple. So I want to cover AR first because you know many people will be uh, new to AR. I know uh, when you start working, right, it will be it will be very very interesting. So now I think I can tell you uh, who am I. So as you know, I am Arun. I am working as a uh, React Native developer in Tiger Analytics and have past three years of experience. But in terms of augmented reality, I'm working from uh, 2016 during my first year of college days. So I worked with Unity and uh, apart from that, Android 14 also. Uh, iOS I had to try, but uh, this native side I have explored. And now I'm moving to React Native, uh, trying to explore AR with React Native. So I've done some few samples. Uh, let me just take that out. So this, all those must be in the uh, uh, Unity actually. All it does is in this. So this is made with Unity. Uh, uh, plain uh, uh, sofa and how the textures are being made. So I'm trying to deduct a plane here. You will see how once I direct the plane inspector, you will see a brown surface. It will take time because it's identified down 2018 or 19. See here, uh, the plane is horizontal plane inspector. The black on right is directed. So the center one, once the plane inspector, the center one will be enabled. So where you have to place your plane. So that is the center yellow mark. So I'm trying to detect. So that's the SDK is there. So we don't have to do anything. SDK will take care. You just need to import that particular tab and need to specify that detect the plane horizontally. It will do it. That's what we have plane selected. So I need to the entire plane. So where I need to place a sofa. So uh, as I saw the this sample uh, sofa object, so where I have given uh, colors options there. So you know, while the right hand side you have this one, so you can change the object. Right? So it's the T part here. So this is uh, for marker list. So what is marker list? So consider you have a um, blueprint for your uh, whatever uh, future house or something. If you scan the uh, blueprint, what if the, your uh, house comes with a big 3D object? So this is for marker based. 
So without this glucose, it will not occur. If you scan any other glucose, it will not occur. So for this particular image, I am doing this. So all this can be labeled in React Native also. This all this can be done in React Native. So I because I need a phone, I couldn't able to show it to you guys. So samples are okay. So uh, you know the excuse me. Hi. Right. So for that blueprint thing, so how accurate will be? Like um, no, that's what for for the blueprint we need to develop some design. Okay. So we need to tell that uh, particular uh, uh, yeah. well, uh, application, right? You need to create a uh, design for that. Yeah. Like, I got that. But uh, say for that blueprint, say maybe an another blueprint which is exactly uh, similar, but maybe missing one or three lines. But that may affect the design, right? So will it show? Yeah. The, the how does this work, right? This is basically CV. As you said, CV only takes up the behind the SDK, right? We have a future points. So while marker based they are right, we have a future point. The future point detect us, okay, this is what this is. This is image, this is, uh, it will compare the future point, what we have given as a target image, and it will create some future point for the target image. So when we try to scan the same image, image it will uh, tell, it will match the future points. If the future points are matched, then it will work. But from this bureau, is there any other packages for AR, VR? Uh, basically, we do we accept for React Native or like for React Native. React Native, we have multiple, but this has the logic community. Other things are two years below, mm -hmm. two years down the line. But this is developing daily, like daily they are working on it. And two weeks back they have updated. Two months or two weeks back they have updated the package. So we need to stay ahead with the React Native on also, right? They are trying to push it out. So we know this is the IPL season, right? When uh, when I was in COVID, right, uh, I was very bored. I was very bored, and I'm a very uh, very CSK fan. So I created uh, actually memory portal for CSK. They when they back then 2018, they owned it. So I just made a small mini portal uh, where the collections of Images are there. And I just placed some random champions of also. So this is where the skybox comes. So if you see, I made a portal, right? So that the skybox come. I told you, right? We are skybox. So skybox is a closed area. So any other question? Yeah. No, I downloaded it from them. So we have a free 3D object website itself. So like how we take images right uh, freely. So uh, these things also, 3D object can be found in uh, free websites also. We have free open source. Okay, so how we want to create this object? We can use Blender, we can use Maya, we can use Meety. They have uh, Blender will be the most efficient one is the open source now, right? Open source is Blender. It's simple only for 3D creation. Animation also you can do in Blender. So uh, if you want to connect with me, you can scan the QR and connect with me it's for LinkedIn. So if you have any further questions or you want to uh, get interaction with React Native, you can also try reaching out. Uh, any other questions, guys? Thank you so much for listening. I know afternoon session it will be very like little boring for the concept. So I know this is what you will get us out for. If you learn the fundamental side, this is what you which interact with this. It will be very uh, immersive to you also while developing. It will be very fun activity also. You can create games also, a lot of things. So uh, thank you guys. Thank you.
Thanks, Arun, for that amazing session. Uh, I hope you guys loved it. Yes, no, maybe. Uh, no, no. Uh, Surya, can we just uh, inform the office team about the uh... yes. Right. Uh, we do apologize for that. There seems to be some renovation going on that should be wrapped up in a bit. Uh, but right now, do you have, if you have any further questions, I know the time is a little short. You can meet Arun. We're going to have a short break in some time. So here's where the feedback segment comes. Do you want the icebreaker? You want to have a small fun icebreaker and then go to your snacks? Or do you want to have the snacks come back and then have the icebreaker? I leave it to you. Snacks and icebreaker or icebreaker and snacks? Choose. Snacks and icebreaker. Anyone else? Right? So uh, anyone else? Snacks and icebreaker or icebreaker and snacks? Snacks and icebreaker. Cool. All right, so we'll take uh, the time right now is 3.16 p.m. So let's finish this event as soon as uh, possible because we have a security policy here as well. So I'm going to leave the break till 3.30. You can have a small snack break in the pantry. Uh, you can connect with Arun. He's going to be here for your questions. Uh, you can have your snacks there. The water bottles of freshmen are all inside. And if you want to connect with me about your micro community events or community events, I'll be here. My name is Kamlesh. So I will meet you guys back here at 3.30, all right? You guys look worse than my college, man. What the? Come on, you guys. Now you're laughing. You, you got to interact more. Yeah? All right. So 3.30, guys. I'll meet you guys here at 3.30. Washrooms are on the far left, the left extreme. So you can follow the pathways. The volunteers are here to guide you. We'll, uh, we'll help you out if you need any questions. Hello, hello, Sashi. Do we have white noise? Oh no, white noise, Kekda. Kekda. Chow? White noise, Kekda. Hello, hello, this is for testing.
Check. 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 One, two, three. Check. Am I audible at the last? Okay. Uh, guys, this is a time check. It's about 3.23. So 3.30. So let's hustle up and be back here by 3.30. Nitin, 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 please come to the dais. Hello. Check. 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 Check.
Uh, guys, we have a time check. We're going to start this second session in another five minutes. So if you, if you are done with your snack, please come into the lobby area. We'll go for the next session. Check, check. Uh, guys, we're going to start in some time. So if you're done with your snack, join us in the main lobby area. We're going to start in some time. So we are on track. So join us in the next two minutes, if you can. Uh, I guess we're going to start the next session. So if you are in the pantry, please finish your snacks up fast and join us in the main lobby area. We are starting in the next one minute. One minute, guys. Uh, time check again, guys. Final time check. We're going to start in the next. I mean, we're already late now. So uh, join us in the main lobby area if you are done with your snack. Check.
Hi guys, time to assemble back. All right, uh, we have uh, most of the guys back in the main lobby area. Just a few of them are finishing their snacks. So uh, I'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker for uh, the next segment. Before that, uh, I hope you had time to connect with uh, Arun for your questions. I hope uh, that was clear. If you would like, still like to connect with uh, Arun, you will have another segment. So you can, uh, Arun will connect to them again and you can have your questions cleared. Uh, before that, do you have any other questions uh, about the way the agenda is moving forward? Any questions? Or are we good to go to the next two segments? Uh, all right, cool. So we'll just wait for another one minute. We have uh, the rest of the squad joining us from the pantry. So once they're all back, we are good to go for round two. All right, so we got to go ahead. So your next segment is gonna be handled by Shanti. Shanti, if you could take the stage and uh, you could take them on to the next session, we'd be going ahead. Uh, again, guys, if you want to use the washrooms, washrooms only show a left extreme. And if you want to just take uh, beverages in the back. And over to you, Shanti. Yeah, I'll take it. Thank you. On. Check. Okay. Check. Can we give a few more minutes for people who are in pantry? Is it okay with you all? I think almost. Only two people, let them come on their own uh, timing. Hello, front and enthusiast. Hello. Good evening, and welcome to today's session on micro front end architecture. I'm actually thrilled to have this opportunity to explore this innovative approach of micro front end with you all. And I am Shanti Palani. I own a nine plus years of IT experience, and basically, I'm a full stack developer, but more of a front end enthusiast. And yeah. That's about me. And before that, I would like to know who are just starting your career in tech world or um, still studying. Good, but quite a few people. With respect to you all, I just want to start with evolution of micro -print -print. Great, I think I'm able to read few of your mind. You guys are asking me to tell what is micro front end first and go to evolution, right? But I guarantee you, if I talk about the evolution first, you will be automatically able to tell what is micro front end is. So let's start with evolution first. <coughs> um, I truly start, I want to start with a metaphor. I want to take an example of a cafe where the owner himself takes uh, the entire uh, responsibility of operating that cafe, right from taking orders, preparing, serving, etc. What will happen in this case? If a lot of people walks in, what will happen? It's a basic question, like not an <laughs> What? Time consuming? Of course, we will have to starve, starve there if we go. So this is close to monolith where the front end, back end, everything is combined together in a single code base and adding any feature or modifying the application was time consuming and risky. Later came in, later came like front end and back end. I would like to go to the same cafe example where the owner now realized he wants another person in the kitchen at least. So he's hiring one more person in, for the kitchen operations, which is equivalent to splitting front end and back end. As the complexity of the application grew, developers started splitting their code base as a front end and back end, where the specialized team started working on their separate modules. And as you know, the front end and back end communicated with each other through APIs. Let's go back to the same cafe because as the crowd comes in more, even the kitchen team with a single person is not able to manage and they are not able to uh, run the cafe effectively. So the owner decided to hire few more people to the kitchen. 
which is almost equivalent to microservices where the functionality is uh, decomposed into independent services in the back end not in the front end and it has certain advantages like uh, the scalability and independence a um, lot of advantages were there but the front end still remained monolith like it is still the same um, so few of the drawbacks are here yeah as you see the complexity and inconsistent code were there later um, it was dependent right so delays uh, releases got delayed and the chal sorry sorry i mistakenly <laughs> clicked the next slide and scalability was a challenge and then uh, technologies if you want to migrate to a different technology it was quite challenging uh, in monolith architecture and there were some um, front end development bottlenecks and team conflicts also were there to overcome all of this we introduced the microservice technology to the front end path as well again let's go back to the same cafe now the owner realized he wants more hands in the front end part as well so he hired few more pe people for cleaning serving and giving the takeaways etc it is close to micro front end anyone want to give a try now what is micro front end i almost told but i haven't given a proper definition but i want you guys to try it because it's all uh, 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 like evident from the example anyone want to try or if you mind if i give you a mic mic please excuse me for a minute like because i want you all to hear what he is actually trying to say uh splitting of whole component into multiple smaller component and giving control to individual like spaces so it works independently but they are interconnected into one page of course he made my job very easy he gave an exact definition of what is micro front end is and i want to encourage him with a chocolate thank you of course as he mentioned oh, sorry i didn't ask anyone else anyone else want to give a try i i actually showed sorry i missed to hear do you want to give a try he said right of course um so that's why i took that example which will give you a evident answer by yourself uh yeah as mentioned here microservice uh, it is actually inspired from microservice which was integrated into in the front end layer and we call it as a micro front end that's it so the scalability and modifications has become so easy and it has some advantages which i can tell you in the upcoming slides so this is the actual definition like decomposing the front end modules into separate functionalities and independent teams will own each of them simple that's it that's it micro front end but we do have certain um, advantages disadvantages and integration techniques which we will see in the next upcoming slides so as i uh, mentioned earlier with the cafe here are the advantages which we overcame overcame from the previous versions like few are like decomposed um, module they work independently and we do have technology freedom where one micro front end can be developed in react another can be developed in angular another can be developed in view as well or else each can be developed in react and can be integrated together into a single common container we we does have the technology freedom and they can be deployed independently like we no need to wait for the team a to complete until team b releases like there is no dependency if we go with the micro front end architecture and then yes they are loosely coupled of course independent means obviously loosely coupled will come and customizable we are uh, like each team is able to customize their application independently like they all are connected interlinked if i talk about one another one will come and then we can update incrementally on each teams the last one is fault tolerant uh, it is like if one application is not uh, working well like it is not going to affect the entire application somehow it is a disadvantage but it is manageable still because that is handled by a separate team we can just have some other placeholder in, in instead of like holding the entire application 
we can also call the particular micro front end next comes when to use micro front end like um, we cannot go directly start using micro front end for all the web application we are developing we have to be careful when to use it actually i have certain like uh, four uh, four um, things when you are building a enterprise level application which is a larger application when you are really building a larger application then this is a best approach or architecture you can stick to the um, web application development and then when you require independent deployments like if you want to uh, deploy your application independently then you can go for micro front end architecture and as i mentioned earlier technologies like if you want to choose different different technology for different modules of the same application then you can go for micro front end and the next one is of course flexible application like you, whenever you want you can uh, optimize customize your separate modules so in such kind of uh, applications you can go for micro front end architecture and these are the some enterprises which actually use micro front end in their day to day development of their application um do you see any familiar names maybe yes can be little louder because <laughs> yes right okay any new names person appa maybe i'm 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 really bad in hearing like i can't able to get what you guys are telling but i see few few names so you can go and check what they are actually like most of them are like european uh, applications enterprises level applications since uh, we are german based company i just took some example from the europe market now comes the challenges whatever may be the technologies however we go to the next level we do have certain challenges in integrating them and few of them are like sharing code or sharing some data between one micro front end to another micro front end will be challenging it is not like it is not achievable it is achievable but it will be challenging somehow to uh, to achieve that and the next one is testing the entire application because individual team will develop their uh, modules on their own they test their own own but as a collective application who is going to test so the testing of entire application will be challenging and then it needs uh, like a lot of uh, team organization and um, communications and responsibility in assigning module because if we are going to assign uh, individual teams individual modules it will it has to be well communicated and well aligned and styling consistency is a major thing like if our because we are going to present it as a single application what if one is in a different color another module module is in a different color this not going to look good so we have to make sure the styling is consistently maintained across like these are certain challenges which can be handled if given a proper attention or taken care at the very initial phase itself and one last thing is performance standard like all the micro front end has to perform well so that it will not affect the overall application so while going for micro front end architecture we have to concentrate on this area so that we can mitigate um, the risk next next comes the code base how we are going to maintain the codes in the repository the name itself will give you an uh, answer does anyone want to give a try what is mono repository is i know it is already written but still i want to yeah correct yeah mal you get uh, one has given answer for single repository sorry mono repository and uh, you want to give a try for multi repository exactly so multi repository um, each micro front end will be maintained in different different repositories they will be deployed separately and they will be coordinated together in a separate container application what about meta now anyone sorry close you 
close like it's close to the answer but still it's not the correct answer no repository actually we are completely talking about maintaining the code like how they will maintain the code meta repository anyone want to give a try sorry Yes. Did you read from there, or you are telling on your own? From there, okay. At least appreciate it because he is just giving the. He is able to reproduce what has been shown exactly. Like it is the combination of mono and multi-repository. Like the parent will be maintained in the mono repository, and the child will be maintained in multi-repository, and they are collectively combined together to bring a single web application that is called meta-repository. Clear? Any doubt so far? I want to give a pass. i need to drink water like you can come up with your questions uh, it's the combination of mono and multi repository correct no so uh, meta you you are talking right okay fine maybe i have a, a live code session i can explain better this one while giving you the code got it it's basically the code maintenance like no, it's nothing related to technology tech, technical stuff just how you maintain your code in your repository now comes the implementation part how we will uh, integrate our micro front ends like either we can do it during build time or run time the last one is hybrid again the last one is always the combination of the first and second um i have few approaches uh, which is coming up they all falls under any of this three so actually i have uh, written like one by one but i let me show all together and then talk up, talk about one after another so the first one is single phase approach and second one is module federation third one is web components and fourth one is server side i frames npm package approach again to make it interactive you guys come up with your answer like able to guess any one or have you come across any one of this approach it might not be in micro front end spa this mm -hmm. like uh, we don't uh, need to reload or the basically not not needing uh, the reload of the page and just loading the uh, loading the data in the same page only without any refresh okay. sort of in a single page application fine would you mind telling the same again to them because basically, i see they are distracted <laughs> Uh, uh, not to trouble you, just to make them. Uh, Basically, is what single page <laughs> application means is uh, to uh, whatever the data is, it uh, it doesn't need any refresh or something. And, uh, the entire data would be shown in the single page single page itself without any refresh. Sort of. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate. Did you guys got what he said? If yes. Uh, we will build everything in, and uh, we will have a single package, right? That will be deployed. But uh, if we are going for micro front end, if I am using uh, React for uh, the main page and for the other pages, if I am using Vue or uh, Angular, then uh, how can we build it in a single bundle? Exactly. Uh, it's a very good question. Actually, uh, single page application is not uh, recommended for all the uh, architects. architectures like we have to go according to our application architecture like you have to go to module federation in this case single page will not stick uh, for all the uh, development areas did i answer you yeah okay even if you are uh, if you are having multiple uh, applications uh, that two in react also mm -hmm. then even then we, can, we can't go with sp right no okay oh, no uh, not not no um when you are saying that we are breaking the entire app into modules 
but we are doing the componentization anyways. So what is the use of uh, breaking the modules again? So, um, for example, we work in an application mm -hmm. where each team contribute to different uh, different modules, but to the same repository. Mm -hmm. We don't do it as a separate repository. Mm -hmm. In such cases, we don't rely on any other team to mm -hmm. complete anything, and mm -hmm. then we can start something. It's the same application where our team independently work on that particular module. That also comes under micro front end architecture, but not in an uh, so explicit way. Still, uh, it is basically micro my point is uh, uh, are micro, is micro front end architecture reusable or something? That, that's why we are doing it, or uh, is there any other reason also? Okay, so the main reason we are going for micro front end is to manage the application. If it is a large scale application with a single team, you will struggle a lot. If mm -hmm. it is like five teams working in a different, different stuff independently mm -hmm. they, because they are really not interrelated. In such cases, going with micro front end architecture is a better option. Mm -hmm. Also, it is not always advisable to pick micro front end. It's truly based on the complexity of your application. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the next one is module federation. Did anyone use module federation in your application uh, development? Actually, I, I can uh, talk about this just like that, but I don't want to end it like that. No means you can simply tell no. No, right? No, fine. So, um, module federation is a plugin introduced by Webpack, which helps us to configure the uh, remote applications and expose them to the parent uh, containers. Like uh, in this module federation, we can independently run applications and we can uh, collectively configure them to the container app. This is what I'm going to show you an example. So maybe we can talk in elaborated way uh, during the demo. And the next one is web components. Like um, we can uh, create some reusable web components and we can integrate the same into our application whenever required. That will come under web components and so server side includes. Like anyone work in Next.js? Yeah, so you guys know better about the server side rendering, right? In, uh, if you want to integrate micro front end architecture with the next chairs, then going with server side includes is a better option. And then iframes. Iframes, anyone? Exactly. We can develop our application just to plug it to the iframe SRC. Simple. But complexity will be uh, you cannot transfer data from a parent or child to the iframe components. Like it will work independently. If you don't have any dependency, Go for it, but it is not highly recommendable because the styling consistencies and other stuff will be difficult in iframe. The last one is NPM. Mic. Okay, I will reveal. Like I'm, I'm hard in hearing. Like I really want a mic. So if I want actually, to actually, my question is, uh, I just wanted to know, uh, what is the difference between like iframe? Also, we can do the same thing. Like we can. Render an HTML uh, app or anything, we can render it inside the iframe. I just wanted to know how it is related to, uh, how can we differentiate from micro, uh, micro front end application to iframe? I just wanted some on. It's an integration method, right? Okay. Uh, my application, uh, I have developed some application separately. Maybe I can show you this example during the demo, but let me explain. Uh. So iframe, you can integrate any other web pages, right? I, I'm going to develop one application as a separate, uh, sorry, one component as a separate application. Think, for example, I have an example with a pricing module where it is running as a separate application. I can plug and play that pricing module with the iframe inside my container app. Maybe I, I'll show you. I'll show you. Stay tuned. I'll show you that. The last one is NPM packages. So being a, a developer, you will come across NPM packages daily. Maybe you can give a try what it could be. I'll, I can help to reiterate if it is wrong or if it is close to what I'm expecting. Yes. NPM packages means then uh, we'll be having library, different libraries and we'll be uh, composing it in a, into a uh, parent application. So uh, yeah. that, so that's how, how we can integrate it. Yeah. Mike's. Yeah. 
each, each application is published as a package and we consume as a normal NPM. Exactly. Correct. Right. The same. Actually. It's okay. You can tell me again. <laughs> yeah, consider we have an application like just, just, uh, just a simple application like we are uh, giving a button inside our application. So the application, if we give any updates inside that, we'll update the package and then we'll in the mono repo or in the application which we consume that we'll just update the package there so that the button will be uh, updated there itself. Yeah, close. Exactly. Anyone else want to give a try? I, uh, I, I have noted all your names. You have chocolates at the end. I have <laughs> minimum chocolates now. Maybe I'll, I'll cover you all at the end. So the basic usage of uh, NPM in the day-to-day -day life is like libraries, uh, plugins uh, that we use that make it updated up to time. Uh, so we don't have to uh, maintain, I mean, we don't have to manually go and update each and every libraries or packages, plugins that we use in our applications. Mm -hmm. So the NPM packages, we have to update it and uh, we will get a latest library or specific uh, version of libraries that we wanted to use. So we don't have to migrate each and every uh, portion of our code. Like, uh, for example, if we use a slick library, uh, uh, we don't have to manually change the version. Like, we don't have, if, we, if in case we are using CDN version of slick, it will be specified version number and we will start using it. If you use a NPN version of slick, so the version is getting updated. Uh, we don't have to manually go and update. So NPN, NPM take care of that. Okay. Got it. Have you any time published? Up? Okay. One more question. Mike. Yeah, I just have a doubt here. Like, why SPA is listed here? Because even though we do, we use model federation web components, whatever approach we are speaking here, it's a part of SPA only, right? Um, no, not really. Uh, but uh, how we can achieve micro front end using SPA? Like, yeah, we can achieve using module and other stuffs. Uh, SPA is basically like the page will not reload. Even in, in the traditional approach, where we'll be having a different URL, so whenever you hit that URL, that entire page will reload. But in SPA, it will not happen. Only during the first time it will happen. After that, everything will be refreshed using the HTTP calls. Okay. Like how we can achieve micro front end using SPA? Tried uh, JavaScript, like including JavaScript in your uh, previous applications. Yeah. You include, right? Yes. Similarly, we can bundle our application as a JavaScript single CDN URL, and you can call okay. the script in a single HTML file, mm -hmm. and you can go ahead and use it. Okay. Got it? Good. So here we have npm package. We have a yarn package also. Yeah. Why don't we list it out? Yeah. It's okay. better than uh, npm. It's more uh, okay. good in uh, performance. Good, good yeah. catch, actually. OK, I'll correct it like npm slash yarn yeah. package method. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, OK, what we really do in npm uh, package approach means we develop our application as a separate uh, module and we publish it to the node package manager as we know it is an open source anyone can publish whatever you want to publish so we can develop our micro front end as a separate npm module we publish it to the repository and we can use it in our any other applications wherever we want that's all about the npm package approach any questions So what's the difference between module federation and iframes? The only thing is we can pass the data from, uh, uh, we cannot pass the data in iframes. In module federation, we can, right? Yes, but uh, the approach itself is different. Module, a uh, module federation is introduced by web package, whereas iframe can be done in any, any, any components. Like you can just go ahead, use iframe tag. You know, it's an HTML tag, right? We can go ahead and use it in any, any, any components to invoke another operate, uh, another uh, module, whereas module federation needs some configurations. We have certain configurations which has to be done to achieve module federation approach. Oh. Maybe uh, I'm going to give you an example with module federation. Sorry? Oh. Yes, as I said to him, I'm going to give you a demo. You can see. Mm -hmm. You want to explain? 
Yes, please. We have. Uh, I have question. another additional question. Maybe first, so, let him answer your first question. So, what the model federation does is, so it has uh, different uh, different repository, right? We will try to import using some uh, hosting URL. So we can import it like a component. It's not like a iframe. We import that that same repo at the component. If it is a iframe, you have to uh, add it in like a, within a iframe. It's like a separate uh, separate uh, uh, like separate the environment. If it is a micro front end, it's like a component within your repository. You mean to say I can import the whole application as a component? Oh, okay. And you can import some model also. It's okay. not like a uh, put the uh, entire component. You can just export that that model of the component A, component B, component C. Then okay. you can pass the props in it. Okay. You have a doubt? Also, uh, you said that it's only available in Webpack, or also you can use Write or any other uh, bundler. Um, I'm going to, it's, it's more of React, right? I'm going to talk about Webpack. Maybe uh, I have no clue what Vue is, what Vue will do. No, yeah. no, not Vue, White. Another, uh, Webpack is a bundler, right? The, there are another bundlers in the market. So it's uh, available only for Webpack or? It's a. Answer your question. Why it had does uh, do have the plugin to do the model federation part? So model federation is actually a concept where we do things, but why it has its own plugin to do it? So Webpack has model federation is part of Webpack five, but again it's a kind of a plugin. So why it also has a plugin for it? Thanks guys for making my job more easier, <laughs> and thanks for stepping in. Any question? Yeah. And Thank another you. thing is like, how do we manage states between? Uh, different modules. I have a last slide for this. Okay, okay. But I thought like if you are not at all going to ask this question, I want to tell it myself and I want to end that session. We do have a say, uh, like a slide at the last for your question. Stay tuned. Um, let's go to the demo, uh, like live coding demo session. I see my screen, right? See it? I actually had a prepared an, an application and I want to run it immediately, but I just want also to go with the uh, like initial setup, how you can set up a webpack application from the scratch. I do have example which I can show you uh, after that. Um, so to, uh, to first set up the basic, uh, okay, let me start with this question. How do you create React apps? Okay, I can hear him a better, so I'll tell what he said. It's like a create React app. We use the uh, uh, NPM package to create our applications. Thank you. Yes. What happened? Okay. Give me. The screen is not working, it seems. Okay, fine, fine. Wait. Let me reshare my screen. You guys see? Good. Thanks for bringing that up. Otherwise, I might be continuing <laughs> without uh, knowing that. Oh, actually, where I live. Okay. How to create React? Actually, okay. How we do uh, creating a React application is we rely on certain packages like create React app, create next app, etc. Similarly, we have a package called create hyphen. MF hyphen app where MF stands for um, right? no module federation. Got it? So I'll, I'll just expand the screen. You guys able to see the screen, right? I'm not, I'm not able to do much. Wait. You guys see? Uh, 
actually it is at the last like you can see right it will ask you for the uh, name of the application i'm just give, going to give like parent app okay my controls in a different place host i have not given a name it's going to take a, take it as host then from the other options you are going to choose application followed by port number i already have this port numbers up and running so i don't want to disturb that ports i'm going to give like a different port number and of course i'm going to choose react you can choose uh, either typescript or javascript and the css options and i'm going to stick to webpack that's it you can do npm install and you can just run your application it's a very basic skeleton it will give you you can go optimize that according to your needs so what host will give you is this configuration and all the host will have it in a better way actually we have to uh, manually import this plugin and we have to uh, do certain configurations you no need to worry if you use this package to create your application got it so i just want to go to the actual example which i have to present to you all i have like uh, three applications running in a different ports like container is running in 8000 pricing is running in sorry not 8000 8080 and pricing is running in 8081 and testimonials is running in 8082 so to showcase you here we have the container hope you see the browser right okay here we have the container application and the pricing application and testimonials what i'm going to do is i'm going to integrate this testimonials and pricing to my container application let me show what needs to be configured and how we are supposed to like integrate them into the parent container shall we any questions so far no right so someone asked about the repositories right this is like um multi repository where i have a um, all the repositories multiple repositories together in a single uh, folder so what i'm going to do is first i'll start from pricing because that's the independent application which is running i'll show what configuration you have to make sure in order to integrate into other applications so the major part is this when as i mentioned this module federation plugin is going to play a vital role in this configuration and below that inside web uh, webpack plugin you have to um, make sure to uh, shanti Shanti, like uh, before going to this, like can you please walk through the uh, structure of each of the applications? Okay. Uh, so what are the Fine. files and components you have, so that we will get a good idea on that. Fine. Um, as I shown here in the actual application, um, pricing is going to have only one component for pricing, and testimonial is going to have one component for testimonials, and the container application is going to have a uh, components like. Uh, header uh, hero section feature section the highlight section and the faq and footer i'll show the code structure the container this is the container and we do have our package js and webpack configurations and inside src i do have the app where the overall application is integrated and in the landing page i have imported the components the components call center the component folder as i mentioned it's like the app bar faq features footer everything is granularized into smaller files like it's not file it's a component i'm going to invoke that component to the main landing page here is the landing page and here is where i'm going to integrate my micro front end like the pricing and testimonials also going to come here only i'll show you uh, uh, next so coming to pricing the same structure the, but the component is only pricing like i don't have much it's only about pricing similar to pricing we have testimonials again under components only one testimonial component which is running independently in a different port clear good right now i'll show you how to 
integrate all of them together to the container application. So before that, we have to expose this um, files in the web pack. This is the syntax. Actually, we have to take care of these four things. One is the name, file name, remotes, and expose. If it is a micro front end, which is uh, close to child component, which we are going to integrate into the container app, then that has to be exposed in the uh, module federation configuration, where this is the um, syntax. The path which we are going to import followed by the actual component. Here, I am not exporting my entire application. I'm just exporting the pricing component alone. You can either export the entire application or you can go with component by component. So here I'm just uh, exporting the pricing component. So this is the syntax and you have to be very careful on the name because this name followed by the component name is the import syntax in the parent container. So you have to be careful with this, this configurations. The same applies for testimonials. Instead of pricing, it is going to be testimonial here. I'm exposing this testimonial because I'm going to import testimonial also to my container application. Any doubt so far? Yes, please. Mike. Thank you. For pricing project, we have only pricing one component. So you are exposing to directly to consume in the container component. Uh, Assume that I have n number of components. So how I can expose and consume in the container? Good question. Uh, I can actually, what I can also do is I can, uh, this is actually an object, you see? It's an object, right? You can add one more object close to testimonial. If you have pricing in this same folder, you can uh, export it like uh, pricing colon, whatever it is. Like it's a it's an object, right? You can keep on adding whatever you want to export. Thank you. Mike, please to the front row. Are you guys good so far? Good. So, these three pages are under the same language, right? Yes. Not a uh, different one, angle. No, no, oh, it's, it's, it's a React session. React. So it's all are in React only. Don't expect any Angular or view. I'm not going to talk about that. So if we use different means, can we able to integrate the same way? How uh, I think so. I'm a React expert. Oh. Maybe I cannot answer you for this question. I want to be honest. Because MFA do the same, right? MF. Sorry, but it's yeah. going to be the same, almost. Oh. It, it's an open source plugin, right? Mm -hmm. If Angular supports um, what's it called uh, Webpack, then for sure we can achieve the same in Angular as well. But I don't want to give you a false false answer. Okay. Anyone else? Good so far. Yes. Okay, that will come in the container because container is the place where we are going to integrate our child component. So whatever we exposed going to come as a remote stuff in the parent container. Uh, okay, I'll show you. So let's go to the container. In the container, in the remote, whatever we have exposed there is going to come as a remote in the in your parent container. But so this is again a syntax. If you want to really note, you can make a note of it. The application name followed by the URL and this is the remote entry file which you um, given in your configuration of the child component, like child application. I'm going to call it as a child application because I don't want to repeat like micro front end A, B, C, it's a, it's a huge. I'm going to call it as a child uh, application. Got it right? A reload. Uh, that issue will be here, or there will not be a reload between the two URLs when navigating? No, there will be not a reload. Okay. It is like rendering a component. There won't be any reload. Um, we are importing node modules in each of the components. So at the end of the end of the combination of the basically end of mod module for federation, 
will the ex, uh, node modules also uh, will get uh, invoked in the parent uh, uh, no it's going to be called as a uh, bundle only here if you see remote entry will have all the bundles in a, in that application which is running mm -hmm. we are directly going to call that so there is no uh, connection between the node modules of your child component mm -hmm. and the parent component okay so basically the um, only the javascript any... only javascript at the end of it only javascript would be imported no yes yes no. Any other questions? So this will be called directly to the rem uh, to the client, not during the bundling, right? That means it will be called directly in the runtime. Yes, it's a runtime approach. I oh. said like build time, runtime, and hybrid, right? Webpack will come under runtime approach. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Uh, how will you share the data between this? Okay, we have a slide at the last. We okay. will talk about it. Okay. How to share the data? Same question. Following up with this question, so um, if it is going to be runtime uh, in each of these applications, right? There will be separate React runtime, right? So when we build the application, like when we deploy the application, will there be Multiple React sometimes no. uh, will be another or only one React. Only one parent container will, which will include this, uh, which that will be running separately, okay. and we will just call them in the parent com container, and it's only going to be one time run. So if you are running this uh, separate, uh, like pricing and testimonials as a separate project, then there will be a separate React container. Exactly. But exactly. when we are including everything together. That will be just only one reaction. Yes, time. we also have to make sure it is up and running. Oh. If it is shut down, then you will not get it in your parent container. Mm -hmm. okay. It has to be up and running as an another application. So the server which is created, right? It is not a React server, it is model model federation server. Uh, it's a React application where we have module federation as a configuration path in Webpack. Webpack helps us to build this React application. Okay. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Excuse me. Here. We do have to re. re yeah, uh, I just wanted to know about the hard reload part when it comes to when we are hosting an application in some other place. So, if we are making any changes on it, for example, if we have a three application, in the third application, if we are making any changes on it, and then how it would get reflected in there. Do we need to build it again in order to reflect the changes or else how it going to be? We have to just restart it. Ah, that's what, uh, like the hard, re, uh, hard, hard reload. Is yeah. yes. Is it required? Yes. So, which means we again need to do the re, uh, rebuild or else how it going to be? Uh, just uh, restarting your application will be more than enough because during starting itself, the build will happen. No need to build it again. But in production, you have yeah, to that's build right. and I'm, deploy. I'm thinking from the production. Production perspective. build and deploy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I build need to do, yeah, rebuild it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Fine. Fine. I think. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, will there be any differences in bundle sizes since using micro? Uh, Even printer? with the mic, I'm not able to get you. No. Will there be differences with? Uh, in bundle sizes using micro front end, um, like or composing everything together will have like a lesser size in less, bundle. Less because the bundle is in a separate application. We are just utilizing the URL. We are not having the bundle here. So that's a disadvantage. Isn't it? It's going to be advantage, right? Bundle size is reduced. No, I asked that only. Like, huh. will it be reduced or reduced. will it be? A... It will be reduced. It will be. So composing it together will be more than. What? Like doing micro. No, printing. because we are going, only going to rely on the URL. Okay. I'll, I'll show you the parent container. We completely rely on the URL. It's not about the full bundle which we are going to import. I'll show you. Okay, thank you. Excuse me. Maybe uh, we do have a networking session at the end. Further questions can be clarified in the networking sessions. Let's stick to the uh, demo and let's complete it first.
so here comes we purely rely on this url the one who asked the last question maybe here we purely rely on the url where this uh, build file relies relies in a different application got it so i have invoked the front end parts in remotes of the module federation configurations and now i'm i'm like i'm authorized to use them inside my components as i mentioned earlier i'm going to use it in my uh, landing page let me first import them import pricing so i do have a local component called pricing since i'm using copilot it has given it to, with respect to the local path so this will be the syntax for importing your micro front end configuration so this is the name which i mentioned earlier like you have to be very careful this is the name and this is the component name let me import the testimonials as well i see some discussions going on no 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 like you can continue so these are how we uh, import our micro front end uh, stuff now it's going to be the same like how we are going to integrate in your application i have a place folder for integrating testimonials and pricing just like this so you can see like the testimonials has came to the container application and the pricing is also integrated in the container application which are developed as a micro front end done sorry can you yes. inspect them yes yes you yeah. want to show me yeah how? i want to see how it looks it will it will be close to your uh, normal component integration there is no nothing you can no, find not out not like iframe or it's just a component yes okay yeah. iframe i promised that i'll show you example of iframe right let's also see how to invoke like uh, testimonials or pricing let me re remove it okay testimonial let's go with testimonials um, i'm going to invoke testimonials as i frame is i see yeah it is giving some default uh, stuff but my testimonial is running in 8082 so now you can see the i frame has loaded the testimonial and this is through micro front end like web pack got it i frame is only about the url but web pack is about the configuration and the integration did i hear you all any backlogs one backlog question is there maybe let's try it away go there um as i answered uh, almost all of your questions let's directly go to the topic which i said i'll cover you in the last how the components are like it's like micro front end share data between each other actually i also mentioned that it will be uh, challenging in micro front end data but we do have certain approaches these are some simple five approaches the first one is event like you can create events in one application micro front end application and you can use the same event to communicate to your child or any other micro front end applications the second one is shared libraries like you create a common library you do hold data in your common library and use across your applications and the third one is context api we have a state management technique called context right you can use context to uh, establish the communication between your one micro front end and another micro front end and fourth and fifth are like a basic one like using web storage like your cookies local storage session storage you can use them and then query string but it is least recommended 
in the query string you can pass your values but it is not highly recommended the worst case you don't have any other options means you can stick to query string um i think that's it maybe if you have further questions we do have a networking session uh, you can come and talk to me if i can i can help you with the answers Yeah, I think you you have questions. Lot of people have questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's say I have an application uh, which has a React and React Native code base named Mono Repo, and uh, I want to share common hooks and constant files between these two. So how would that be possible? Because in this example, only the UI has been shared. Is there a possibility where I can share hooks and other constants? Yes, uh, I said like common libraries and common uh, common stuff, right? You can have them in common repository. You can publish them as a package or whatever you want to publish, and you can invoke in your micro frontends. It is purely up to you how you want to integrate, how you want to build, or how you want to architect your application. Yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah. Is all these three apps? It is rather required to create using that YMF app. Yes, creator. yes. I uh, actually created all the three apps using the React YMF app. So, is it possible to integrate this YMF in the existing React app, which is created using Create yeah. React app? Yes. Only web pack configuration. You have to do it manually. Okay. Other things are the same. Same React with the web pack. Only the configuration has to be done manually. Um, yes. So you are uh, requesting the component from the URL, right? I hear a lot of noise from the side. Like, I'll come there. Okay. Um, so you are importing the component from the URL, right? Will it appear in the network tab? Ah uh, yes. 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 So why not use Turbo Repo or something which makes uh, these things a lot easier, right? Oh, sorry, I didn't get your question. Uh, there's a thing called Turbo Repo, right? Uh, from the Triangle Company itself. Yeah, I was not. I sure no idea. It. Okay. No, if I know that, I can relate. Like okay. I want to be honest. I don't know. Okay, that. sure. Thank you. So I have a doubt. Yes. So how uh, we are importing a component? We are just mapping it. So can we uh, ask? Access or send the data using props for the same component pricing or uh, testimonials. Uh, no, no, we can't send. No, we can't send in model federation. We can able to access the storages and the context APIs or something so close. This to is them. how we can able to access. Otherwise, so we can't. Yeah, these are the challenges. What I mentioned. The first point I mentioned in challenges sh sharing state and data between components will be quite challenging. But we do can be done with the previous slide content. Yeah, I have one question related to live. So, uh, like, we have separate domain, right, for uh, product pricing and the testimony. So, it will uh, like a search engine after the Google will crawl that URL. Sorry. The Google can crawl that URL, like pricing testimonial is separate domain, right? Yes, you can. No, no. My question, uh, like, so uh, you are uh, know about SEO, like search engine optimization, yes, right? Yes. For that, we need to have a single domain. For the like, if you are maintaining Flipkart.com, I need to have some Flipkart.com. So if you are going with the pricing or as testimonial, we need separate domain like Flipkart.com slash pricing or uh, Flipkart.com slash testimonial. We need right. No, no, actually, separate domains are not really mandatory. Okay. Just running the application will be more than enough, and you just need a URL. Okay, so it's a public. Then uh, how about security? So uh, if I know the your domain, I can use it for. I can get it to my site. Uh, no. no. So because it's a public URL, you are uh, finding. Not a public URL. Like you will not expose right the URL to anyone. It's not a predictable URL. Like remote remote entry, the path names and all will be not evident. Like it's up to the company who is configuring the webpack stuff. Like it's it's not exposed to anyone. It's it, it's a, we do have security in this. Maybe further questions we can take it like uh, okay. in the networking session yeah. because we are running out of time. Yeah. One more yeah. session is there to be covered. We can guys, connect uh, after after this. Sorry. Yeah. After after the final session, we have a networking uh, which can happen uh, outside. Probably uh, everyone can meet uh, the speakers and like ask a number of questions. They are all waiting outside for you. Okay.
Uh, let's get uh, started with the next. Yeah, thank you. All right, so guys, uh, before we jump into the last segment, how how alert are you guys? Are you guys very alert, not alert, sleepy, very alert, low? My man just said low, okay. No, huh? high, high and low or low, low, low? I mean, low, high, all right. So moderate, nice, someone's being honest, okay. So how's your choice? Yes, high, low, high, I mean like, yes, no? I really can't hear you guys, come on. Yes, all right, so before we jump into the last segment, let's make a small pit stop. I won't take much of your time. Uh, how, how long do we commit? Uh, 10 minutes? 10 to 15 minutes. I'm gonna leave you in the hands of my trusted colleague, Farooq and uh, JP. Both are very fun guys. Farooq is a mentor himself and JP is, JP? He's Superman, so I'm going to leave you in their hands. They're going to have a small, fun icebreaker. Feel free to volunteer for these activities. Feel free to interact with the team. Feel free to communicate with them. The more you open up, the more you engage, the more fun this is going to be before the last segment. And you can also network after that, all right? So I am handing it over to Farooq and JP. Thanks, Nitin. Thank you, Nitin. I, I think he said uh, our plan, so this is go going to be an icebreaker. And uh, you can see QR code, right? So I'll tell you the agenda. So there's a QR code. All you need to scan and go to the URL, register your name, and you will be joined to a quiz. So we'll have a certain number of questions. You'll have to answer that. The faster you answer, you'll come to the leaderboard. After all the questions are done, the leaderboard, like the people, top three people or top five people will be awarded a small gift, OK? And the questions will be like technically simple questions, but still engaging questions. Okay. So you get the agenda. We'll, we'll give some time for you to register. 28 participants. That's for so far, 28? Yeah. 29. Please, guys. Uh, so do we know the number, total number? Maximum 100. 60. So we are 60 here, and I would request you all to participate. Guys, uh, whenever you are giving the name, please be... Uh, yeah, so that you can identify your name. The correct name. <laughs> Otherwise, some uh, crazy names, we can't identify you. The questions are very easy, don't worry. The faster you answer... Cruiser Blaze. Yeah. Who is that? <laughs> 65 total number. Okay, fine. Uh, 47 so far. 48. Yeah, cool. Ah, let's wait. One more minute. Nameless. Nameless. Who's that? <laughs> Who's that nameless? <laughs> Don't read it. Let's, let's see. Please check your name. Yes, please. 50. So far, 50. What a Ganesh. 54, 55. Ten more. <laughs> Can we? Are we good? Guys, all registered. Anyone yet to go? Yeah, that's what we just confirmed. So I'm waiting for another ten more participants. Yeah. 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 I'll wait. We'll wait. Yes, uh, okay. have you all registered, please? Sixty-four. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, we can. 
guys all done is there anyone who is yet to do yeah yeah so uh, please be mindful on your time whenever you are answering do at the earliest all done right can we start the questions are simple but the faster you answer you will be in the top okay and shall we start correctly yeah yeah you have to all answer correctly <laughs> okay shall we start in 3 Two, one, start. Oh, already there's a second. Yeah. yeah. Oh, are you? Turning this. Questions. Come on, come on, guys. Sixty nine. MC is leading, and Shamila. Come on, guys. DJ Hamad. And how many MC is going on a roll here? Navinas, oh, take an MC now. Come on, someone challenge Naveen. Come on, come on. He is building the gap now. Come on, him not. Come on, Ashwin. Come on, come on, MC. Challenge Naveen. Between one and two, come on, Hemna. Unfortunately, some technical issues for Naveen. Unfortunately, sorry, Naveen. Mm. 
Dan dan uh, Nah, itu time ada auto quiz dah tu. Yeah, so now I think we are done. Like, yeah, sorry. Yeah, see no. Just. Yeah, yeah, we can pause it. Okay. Can I can I give one moment? Huh? Just one more minute. Yeah. Just final minute. Yeah, guys, final minute. To so raise your hmm. position. Come on. I hope we top five already finished. Those don't who have worry, not we don't show please. beyond five, so others don't have to worry about their positions. Seventy-five participants. Yeah, like uh, someone has logged in twice. Seems. <laughs> okay, guys. It's done, right? Haru? Yeah. Yes, we are ending the game now. First place, second, third place, Yadu, second place, Vimal, and first place goes to Ashwin. Can we have them here? Yadu. Yeah, please. And Vimal, please. But we, you need to tell them. And Ashwin. So, uh, top three or top five? But uh, Ashwin will get some some uh, better uh, gift here. JP, JP, four and five. Please, DJ Hemat and GK. Yeah, GK. Vimal, Vimal, Yadu, Yadu, sorry, Hemat, and GK. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your participation. Yeah, uh, we shall uh, finish this quiz off. Um, so next we will be having our um, another session. So I will hand over the mic to Nitin. Thank you. So we're back to the final segment of today's session. Uh, I hope you guys had fun. Yes, no? Yes, no? Yes? I feel like now everyone's a little talk. I mean, they're talking a little now. Yes, no? Again? Yes, cool. All right. Uh, so the next session is going to be handled by Danny. So I think all of you had fun last segment. Everyone are happy. So midway through this segment, we'll supply the re refreshments to your desk itself. So you'll be getting your snack on your desk. So midway through this segment, you'll be having your snack. So you can be in your places. We'll give the snack to your desk. Uh, all right. So we'll go to the next segment, final segment from Danny. So Danny, if you could come on stage. So Danny, about him. He has been a teacher for kids from classes six to eight, and he's been teaching a lot of kids. And he's written his own book uh, in Java uh, on Java. So he's a very interesting guy to interact with. So I'm going to give you Danny. He's going to give a brief on himself, and he's going to take you to the last session. Uh, after this, he'll also be having a networking session. So if you have any questions right now, you could ask me, or as we get move on to the next segment, uh, any questions on the workflow or event flow? No. Hmm? All right. So over to you, Danny.
Okay, am I audible? Cool. Okay, nice. Just one second. I need to like set up my screen share. Okay, uh, quick question. Is the code text visible to everybody? Uh, is it visible to everybody in the back as well? Okay, cool. All right. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for everybody who is here on the weekend. And also like really thanks for uh, waiting for the third session. It's actually like, I, I can understand it's already like very tiring to all of you. But this talk, I'm actually planning to keep it a little uh, short with a bit of hands-on coding. So before I start, how many people here know how to work with React? Can I get a raise of hands? Okay, pretty much everybody. So how many people here have heard about web components? Can I get a raise of hands? Uh, I can see a total of five, six hands. Okay, awesome. Uh, so here is the thing, when React came out, it introduced something very interesting to the front-end development world. So that is something we called componentization of our UI logic, correct? So once we started coding in React, we started like building everything as components. So then what happened is a lot more frameworks came into the picture that actually brought the same componentization logic across different languages. For example, Angular came out. Then we had languages like uh, Vue, Svelte, all these frameworks came into the picture. All of them introduced a new, their own implementation of the component syntax. But what many people are yet to realize is that the web natively brought it, its own component, componentization architecture, but it was relatively unused. So what we are looking at is something called web components. So these are native web technologies that are used for building components. So first question is, you might be wondering, uh, uh, what is this tech? Why haven't I heard about it much? So the reason is, since React took over the whole framework and the JavaScript library ecosystem, the actual need for building web components has been a very niche and a unique uh, need. For example, many enterprises who wanted to like uh, stick to their own a native build pipeline who didn't want to invest in like moving to entire create react app ecosystem didn't want to like completely migrate a code into a whole new uh, environment they actually really prefer using the web components ecosystem because web components doesn't need any additional tech to run it can you can actually write web components in plain javascript in your uh, html file and the browsers will actually run with the direct implementation so to learn and work with web components, there are three key concepts that you will have to learn. So three key concepts are custom elements, shadow DOM, and HTML templates. So instead of like explaining all of these individual concepts one by one, I think it would be better if I can directly code and show it to you what these individual items are. So first, let me start with something called custom elements. So remember, when you are building something with HTML, you see all of these HTML DOM elements, you see div tag, you can see the section tag, h2 tag, all of this tag. So what custom elements do is it lets you define your own custom tag that you can add to your HTML page. So this is how a custom tag will look like. So this is a custom tag called simple greeting. So what it does is the name attribute I'm giving, say for example, I'm giving the name as web components it will print the greeting as hello web components. So let me just show you how it will look. So this is how the greeting will look like. If I pass the name here, it will automatically like render the name as a 
uh, paragraph tag along with some styling. So let me start with showing how to build this custom element. Okay. Let me zoom it in a little more. So let me start with a very simple HTML file. So this is a normal HTML web page. Uh, I will start by giving it a name, custom element. So in this HTML page, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna include a simple script tag. And I'll set the type as module. So once I have defined this script tag, what I'll do is I will be writing a special class here. Thanks to GitHub Copilot, it's auto completing pretty much all the code, but I wanted to go step by step. So let me just remove everything. So first step is creating a class called simple greeting. And this class has to extend an inbuilt class called HTML element. So this HTML element is native to the browser. This is how all the actual browser elements are built. So once I got the simple greeting, what I can do is I can do custom elements.define. So this custom element is part of the window web API. So once I do this, whenever I mention simple greeting in my DOM, whenever I mention simple greeting, it will know it has to render the entire simple greeting component using this specific class. So the advantage of that is now you can encapsulate most of the UI logic and your custom code logic under a class which is actually native to the browser. Simply means you can build React styled components directly on the browser. So let's start with how it works. So first, once I create the simple greeting, let me create something called a, uh, a private variable probably. I'll call this shadow root. So this is nothing but a private variable in JavaScript. This is similar to how you declare like private methods in other languages like Java. Once this is done, what I'll do is I'll have a constructor. And since I am extending an in existing class, I always have to start the constructor with a super call. Then here is the interesting part. In this custom element, I'm gonna attach something called a shadow dome. So this is the syntax for a shadow DOM. I'll set the mode to open. So what this creates is it creates a special DOM element. This DOM element is going to be different from the regular DOM element because this DOM element will exclusively live under the simple greeting tag that I have mentioned here. Okay, so I have created a custom uh, DOM element called the shadow root. Then what I'll do is once this ST, uh, custom element has been attached to my uh, HTML page, it will call something called a lifecycle method. We will come to this lifecycle life method a little later. So first what I'll do is I'll do a connected callback lifecycle. So in this lifecycle, what I'll add is, first I'll create a style string. So look at this, this is a string that basically contains a simple style tag. After that, I'll also create a content string so this content string basically contains a p tag, a paragraph tag. So this says hello and it gets the attribute. You know attribute is basically whatever we pass as an attribute to the HTML tag. So I'll say this dot get attribute and I'll say the attribute as name. If the simple greeting has a name attribute, bring that attribute name. Then finally, remember the shadow DOM we created earlier with the shadow root private variable. I'll simply say set the inner HTML as a combination of the style and the content. So this is done. What I can do is I can just go and check out this page. Localhost colon 8080 slash custom element. And you can see it has rendered hello web components. Now this is where things get interesting. So what I'll do is I'll inspect this go into my actual uh, DOM on the dev tools, you will see simple greeting is now, okay, let me zoom this in a bit. Okay, simple greeting now is available as a regular HTML tag in the dev console. Now inside that you will see a special section called the shadow root. So remember when I said we are adding a shadow DOM by calling this dot attach shadow. So it creates a sub DOM inside the simple greeting under which 
our actual style and the paragraph tag I created lives. So this basically encapsulates these two components under the styling from the rest of the web application. Because if you are rendering this style tag anywhere else, if it is outside in the normal DOM, what will happen is it will apply the style to all the paragraph tags. Now what I can do is, I can write another paragraph tag here. I can write a paragraph tag saying hello world. Do a refresh and you can see the style tag hasn't been like leaked into the rest of the DOM. The style has been encapsulated under the original uh, shadow DOM alone. So this provides us with a unique set of tools that will let us build components which are similar to React but without any build tools and completely native to the web app. And what even makes this web components a lot more interesting is that the way it interacts with the rest of the JavaScript. So remember, you have any uh, normal DOM element. For example, let's say you want to query for a div with a certain class name. You do document.query selector. Now, here is the interesting part. The document.query selector will actually work with custom elements as well. So let me create a brand new script tag here. And I am going to do a query selector document.query selector. Let me call it simple greeting. And let me just keep it in a variable called dollar greeting and let me print it out. So once I see my console, after I queried the document, you will see on the console, it actually prints out the custom element entirely along with its shadow root. And if I want to further go into the simple greeting and do further queries, I can do using something called the shadow element. So I can do dollar greeting dot uh, shadow root dot query selector P. So this basically is a simple greeting element and then in its shadow root query for the uh, custom, sorry, query for the normal element p tag. So let's see what it provides as an output. Ouch, I think I used a wrong attribute probably. It's called inner or shadow root. Mm. Okay, what was the name of that attribute? Okay, just a second. It's shadow root only. Maybe I might have made some typo. It's shadow root, query selector. Okay, did I make the shadow root open or closed? I have made it open. Ah, it's probably because I made it like private. Just a second. Let me make the shadow root public by removing the hash. Hmm, that's weird. I'm unable to directly access the shadow root. I'll come back to this a little later. But what happens is that you can actually query the contents of the shadow root just like any other normal JavaScript tag. I just uh, think I may, made a small mistake with the property name. Let me get the property name a little later. And here is where things get interesting. What I can do is that I can also do set attributes. So if I want to change the attribute, remember you want to like change the ID or a class, you can actually do dot set attribute. 
and actually modify the name directly. But here, since JavaScript is not reactive by nature, JavaScript is basically a non-reactive language, we will have to use something called RxJS, we will have to use ReactJS, or we will need a compiler like Swell for it to have reactive capabilities. But since it is non-reactive, at the moment, if you directly set an attribute, there is no direct way for the web component to know the attribute has changed, unless we need another lifecycle method. So let me show you what happens if I try to change the attribute directly. So what I did is, I created an attribute change with a three second time. So there is a three second timer after which the attribute name has changed to react. However, the name is like not reflected on the actual web component. So to achieve that, what we will need to do is we need to have something called a life cycle method. So how many people here worked with React when React had life cycle methods? I think almost, okay, it's less than half actually. That is interesting because back in the day when React came out, it was a class. The syntax was similar to how the custom element syntax looks like. We do extend react.component to write. So once a custom element has been created, it has some callbacks. So first thing is the connected callback, which I told you. This is similar to component did mount. The component has been like attached and now to render the HTML. Next, we have the disconnected callback, which is like component will unmount. What is interesting is something they provide is called the attribute changed callback. So what the attribute changed callback does is whenever attribute value changes, it will invoke this function and we can do necessary re-rendering or any other forms of activity for a specifically changed attribute. Since it doesn't have virtual DOM or any other functionality at the moment, attribute change has to be handled manually. Pretty much we will have to re-render the entire HTML. So what I will do is first I have to determine, first I have to define what are all the actual reactive attributes that will change. So for that, there is a method called observed attributes. So we will have to say static. Uh, either I can say observed attributes directly or I can define it as a getter, static get observed attributes in case I want to run some logic. So I'll say observed attributes are name. Then I will add one more lifecycle method called attribute change callback. So once the attribute change callback is provided, it will give me three arguments. One is the attribute that changed, the attribute name, the previous value and the current value. So that I can compare if the previous value and the current value are same or not. Usually these kind of things are already like abstracted away by React because React already does a deep equality check. So if the attribute changes, it will know by the reference e equal comparison. So these are like stuff that is abstracted by React, but if you're working with the native web, you will have to handle it on your own. So here I'm saying if attribute value is equal to name, simply run the connected callback one more time. So it will just re-render the entire uh, DOM set, yes? Virtual DOM is play basically a JavaScript re-implementation of the DOM. It is designed to make updates like this faster. But here, Shadow DOM is more native to the web. So this is something the browsers know. Shadow DOM is like exactly a copy of the regular DOM, except it renders in its own subtree. Basically, the styles, the JavaScript references are like isolated under a single tag. The custom element I have created here. So now, this connected callback has been added. So if I go and refresh the page now, so in three seconds, this will change back to React. Basically, all the interactions with the custom element are reflected back into the actual component. Now, this is a very, very simple implementation of how a web component works on the browser. So it is like a way of writing components and it can run directly on the browser. You don't have to like uh, need any complex bundler setup and you can directly work with the custom element like any other HTML element. So this actually provides us a lot of interesting use cases. So right now, these are the three major places where the web components are being used. First of all, Chrome extensions. If you have like installed any Chrome extensions, you'll know they will display within a page. 
so how many people here have used grammarly before I, yeah i think pretty much all of you tried grammarly so grammarly if you look at it it appears inside a web page technically it runs part of a actual web page when you load that page so their entire grammarly application is actually wrapped under something like this it's a custom grammarly element that was built using custom element and all the grammarly logic are like hidden under the shadow dom so that it doesn't leak the styles or anything out to the actual parent website and doesn't actually break the parent website second is if you are a uh, you you have a comp uh, company website and you want to add some third party application uh, something like a chat widget or something like a banner that appears on top of your application those third party plugins often write their code using web components custom elements and shadow dom to make it very easy for the user to add the plugin to any web page without bothering the actual underlying website and finally this is used by large corporations who want to build ui libraries that work across all frameworks especially frameworks like carbon or other design systems if they want the framework to uh, library to be framework independent because for us we usually will work in a team where react is the universal uh, library for the entire team everybody in the team will be using react so we can build a component in react and we can expect the organization to adapt but in large teams what they will do is they will build a react uh, library using react but they wrap the thing under web component so tomorrow if anybody in the organization wants to build a plain html website and they want to run a react library built by somebody else they can directly import and use without actually having any problems so here i can show you a small poc on how i can build a react application and run it directly in html without any other support directly using web components uh let me create a new react component uh html so uh this is just like a proof of concept for everybody to understand how web components actually render other lang languages inside but technically this can be extended to any other framework like swell view a lot more other stuff so first let me start by adding a simple script tag and let me create uh, a dialog box component so this dialog box extends html element and hopefully i i am getting lot of suggestions from copilot shadow root okay i think i have to turn off copilot otherwise it won't let me code i will come to this later i actually need the copilot for something but not now so i started with uh, setting up a new shadow root then i'll have a constructor so here i have to do something called this dot attach shadow so this will set up a new shadow node i'll keep it open i wanted to show you the difference between open and close but because i made a mistake on the property i am not able to show that but i'll come back to that at the end of the talk so i have the uh, shadow root constructor set up next what i'll do is i'll do a connected callback so this connected callback is going to render normal html string so i'll do this dot shadow root but here is where things get interesting so what i'm going to do here is instead of rendering a normal dom element i'll do something called a react element because you know you can actually do react uh, tags with react dot create element correct so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to import the react javascript files so let me import them here so this is like the esm builds of react so technically react doesn't need any custom bundlers for it to run by itself the reason why we have all of this bundlers is because we are using jsx 
So I am going to eliminate the JSX part. So React can run natively directly here. So I am importing them from the ESM.SH web page. So I am having the React shadow root here. So next, what I'm going to do is, in the shadow root uh, section, I'm actually going to target this as a target for the React DOMS render method. So technically, when you render a React component, you always provide it with a HTML root tag, right? Div, usually will give it as div with uh, ID app. So instead of giving that, I'm going to give it as shadow root. So let me just copy this React DOM render setup. So on the connected callback, here I'll say create element, h1, null, just for now. So once the React is connected, a connected callback is set up, I'm going to render this with a new element, and the element is going to be h1. So once this is done, let me define the custom element. Define. I'm going to call it dialog box. I'll say custom dialog box. And render the dialog box component. So ideally, if our code is correct, it should be able to render the h1 tag in the custom element. So it's react hyphen component. Okay, let me quickly inspect. So we have the custom dialog box, shadow root, and we have the h1 tag. So this we can make it a little more interesting. What I can do is I can build a full-fledged dialog box in React. So let me say const dialog box component. And since it is like written without JSX, I will need to like copy the code. It's difficult to write it directly. But when you are building it as a library, you can bundle it using JSX. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the entire React component setup. So let's go over the code. First, I have use state, open or close. And I actually have a button here. On click, it will call the open dialog method that will set the state to true. And if it is like clicked out on the button, again, the close button, it will call the close dialog. So once this is done, in my custom element, I can directly say react.create element dialog box component. So once this is done, I refresh, I can actually see my React dialog box button. And if I click on it, it shows the simple dialog box. I can close, I can pretty much work with it like any other normal web element. But internally, it is like built completely using React. So it doesn't matter what technology the underlying shadow root is built out of. You can build it with the Svelte, you can build it with Angular. As long as it is wrapped around by a custom HTML element, the rest of the application can work and interact with it like any other normal HTML in entity. So this is also like used widely in the front-end microservices architecture. Um, before like the module federation became famous. I think the last speaker was talking about module federation. So now we are using this shadow root extensively in many of the actual uh, applications whenever we have to introduce or try a new technology. So this is a very, very nice little POC. I rec highly recommend everybody to give it a try. You can find or learn about shadow uh, uh, root, custom elements, shadow DOM, all of this in MDN. So, if you want to even for, do a deep dive, how actual enterprises are using this technology out, there are like interesting frameworks here. So we have frameworks like Lit, Dev, Stencil, and Polymer. So these are like uh, backed by pretty good companies, and they are like very nice to work with. I am a big fan of Stencil.js. I have been like building, I have built a UI library before that is built on top of Stencil. The advantage is that I built it with Stencil. I used a storybook and all the modern toolkit available. But the UI library can run in any framework. If I have a Svelte application, I can directly put the UI library there and it will run. 
it can run inside a react application it, it is completely independent because technically it is a normal html tag that i can use anywhere in my application cool so any questions so this actually concludes my talk which is a direct hands-on poc on what is web components how to work with it in a real uh, life environment if you have any questions feel free to ask So, yes. hi bro. Uh, so, right now we are uh, in my in our company. We are maintaining our own design system, and the main problem that we are facing is like they override the styles. So, how complex it will be to because I was evaluating this custom element so that I can render the current elements like say button inside it so that people I mean other developers can't override it. So, is is that easy to do or? Because I'm still evaluating it. So actually, if your target is like CSS not leaking out to the parent component, custom elements is not the right solution. Because Shadow DOM is created for a different reason. It's not designed for CSS isolation. It's rather built for building independent components altogether. So if you are building a React-based library, I am hoping it is going to be a React library, right? Doing custom DOM, introducing a Shadow DOM in between React components completely breaks the whole point of having the virtual DOM and the React's performance benefits. Because now you have independent, full-fledged DOMs in your React component. That is actually not the good practice to use React. So what you should try is using something like a Tailwind CSS, which basically like uses the utility-based approach to abstract CSS classes or styled components, styled system tools like that, CSS and JS, or CSS modules. Those are like approaches which is designed to encapsulate CSS under React components. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Pardon? Can you add Tailwind to it? Yeah. Can you show it? Pardon? Like, can you uh, try using the Tailwind CSS, CDN URL and... Uh... Yeah, you, you just write the CDN URL here. Uh, where is the example? This is the dialog box. Uh, see, I have the style tag here, right? Here you just add a link rel and put the CDN URL for Tailwind directly there. That's it. So uh, I basically have a uh, two questions. One is like uh, from the parent, uh, is it possible to override the styles of the component? Pardon? From the parent, is it possible to override the styles of a web component? Okay, from the parent. Yeah. Uh, so here is the thing: the uh, shadow elements in the sh shadow DOM, right? They always accept inherit the styles of the parent. So if the font style or the alignment, all the things that appear with inherit are by default inherited by the style component. So to tag off, we set inner, inherit to uh, inherit all to none. So we can prevent the parent styles from leaking into the children. But if you want to supply a custom style, I'll say set up an attribute and supply the class name down to the children uh, elements by setting it up as an attribute, similar to how you customize styles in React. You set a class name to the parent, right? And you pass the class name down. That is a good approach I will recommend. Okay. And the other one is uh, regarding the attributes. Uh, regarding? String, regarding the attributes in okay. web components, only strings can be passed or uh, is there any other objects or arrays can okay. be passed to? In HTML, attribute are always strings. So if you want to pass a JSON, it will be a JSON string. You have to run JSON parse manually to get it out as any other value. Because you are looking at in terms of HTML. In HTML, attribute, attributes are going to be strings all the time. Even if you want to invoke a JavaScript function, the JavaScript function itself is the string when you are passing it via HTML attribute. So all the rules of plain HTML elements apply to the custom element as well. Yeah.
No. It will only, only the properties that are affected by the inherent nature of CSS will affect. Also, you plan and offer the web components, sorry, uh, for the shadow DOM by setting inherit, inherit to none. Suppose if a component. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can import it as long as you just import and assign it directly to the shadow root. Because it's a normal uh, JavaScript component, all the imports work. You just have to assign it to the right variable after you import it. Component to another. Uh, How do you pass data from one HTML element to another? Hmm? I'm asking without web components, how will you work with normal HTML elements? Just pass the variable uh, using the event. Uh... Listener, correct? Mm -hmm. Same approach would be here as well. Th this is just a built on top of HTML element. Mm -hmm. So all the event listeners, everything will work here as well. Mm -hmm. Elements present inside the shadow road. If you want to write any styling CSS, should we have to make an inline CSS or can we write any files and get You can write an external file in CSS and use link rel and, and yes. directly add it inside the shadow, shadow road. It so will link rel is the only way to add a yeah. files. Technically, that is the only way in entire HTML altogether. If you want to include CSS from outside, it's using the link tag. What React does is it just abstracts that behind like certain tools. At the end of the day, even if you build it with React with the CSS in JS, the final output, if you go and check, it will be like plain HTML with link tags. Reports from an external file. I thought if we give it in uh, global means, uh, it will take it, I thought. Maybe. It, it does take, like I said, it will do inner but it does directly take the things itself. All right, any more questions? Cool. Uh, thank, thanks a lot to everybody who spent the time here. Hope my session was a little helpful with you in learning a new concept. If you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. I'm always like uh, happy to help. Okay, right, so we are at the last segment. Uh, do you have any questions or do you have any uh, queries that you would like to ask? All right, so we'll go about uh, with the end note after which uh, we'll open this lobby for a networking session. Uh, but please do note, due to, due to a security policy, will be the facility will be closed down at uh, around six. So six, let's keep six as a threshold time. So the doors will close at six. So we should be having uh, an end note right now by uh, Surya. So once we're done with the end note, we, you feel free to talk with uh, everyone here. We'll open the lobby for a network session. If you have any questions, you can approach uh, any of the speakers who are here with us. If you want to approach about our community, uh, organizing community events in the future, you can approach me. Uh, and uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to uh, Surya or Nikhil. Over to you, Surya, for the end note. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nitin. And also, um, thanks for the speakers, first of all, and uh, also the participants. It was like, as I already mentioned before, who, who, who like, uh, participated. The first meetup, I would see the crowd is like not reduced. So whenever I go, like it, it will be like reduced half after the break. So uh, thanks everyone for coming here and uh, spending uh, Saturday like till six. Thanks everyone for the um, participation. And also I would like to thank uh, Talentship for providing the venue and also Talentship volunteers and who are uh, 
stays and like sets up these things. Thanks everyone. Big round of applause for uh, them. Thank you guys. And probably like Nikhil. Oh, yeah, as Ray mentioned, thanks. Thank you everyone for coming here. And I would like to remind you guys, we have a, a ticket giveaway for React India. So see the Twitter. I already posted. I already seen people posting about the meetup today. So yeah, pick some photos. There is, you know, uh, some games outside. You can play uh, foosball, billiards, PlayStation. So you can just roam around and play. And also click some photos about the event and QT period. And we'll select a winner probably tomorrow or day after. All right. Thank you. So we we have seen like uh, one or two clicks uh, reposted or posted in the Twitter. Uh, please like do post because it's you're gonna win ticket out of it like lucky draw. And uh, to recognize the speakers, uh, I want uh, probably like Maha to give away uh, one gift to the speaker. Yeah. <laughs> And Nikhil is taking his laptop to give. No. An honor, uh, Shanti. Oh. Yeah. Probably like Maha Yukin. Dani Akash. Okay, uh, we have speakers outside. Uh, probably, if anyone wants to uh, connect with them, uh, uh, you can uh, go out and uh, connect. And uh, yeah, that's it. Over to. All right, so we're at the last segment. So, just a quick summary wrap up. Uh, please do follow us on uh, Discord. I'm going to be opening a separate feedback page there. Uh, you can drop in your feedbacks directly here. And if you want to connect with us more on Discord, Discord is open. So I'm opening the floor for a networking session right now. Again, a reminder, due to security policies, doors close at 6 p.m. So we'll be giving you a, rem a small reminder at 5. Uh, I'll give you a small reminder at 5.50 and uh, we'll wrap it up after that. All right. So if you want to meet any of the speakers, the Arul, Arul is here on the right side. Uh, Danny is here back there. Shanti, Shanti is all the way back there. So you can connect with them and you can interact with them if you want to. And uh, over to you guys, have fun. Have uh... yeah, uh, volunteers do stay back. Uh, and if you uh, if you also want to be a part of our team, if you want to volunteer for uh, this uh, segment of events, uh, please do reach out to me or Surya directly here. All right, thank you guys.